mamo ite ana na kuwa ute ahi. Bahi ba ko ko na kuwa ite ana na iye na mau ko ko na kuwa uko ko ana na kuwa atau ke ana na kuwa e ana na. Aku mai mo ke ana na kuwa ite ana na ite hemu na na kuwa na na kuwa ute ahi kene kalo kawai le ula. Olo he ya oi. Na na ike na na ko ko na na kuwa ke ana kuwa upuni o ko na na kuwa ute ahi kau kau ina ha awal na na. Hana ite ana na hana. O na wai ke ana na ite kuwa mama ite hemu ai ai na na kuwa ke ana na ute ahi. I kala ni o ke ahi o kama ue aku e ke ahi o kala i e ku ku i ahi. Na ko na na kuwa o e na mo kuwa o ke aku na na kuwa ute ahi. E aku mai. Aku no no ite aku no no kuwa ute aku aku kuwa no na iya lau, e na e lau ama kuwa no na iya u, e na o kia le kuwa na o kia e mai mai e mai mai nei ka aku no e tamano, mano kuwa u he u aku na u e te na kuwa u, aku e te he mu e na na iya u, a i te na na i te kuwa aku no no kuwa u te wai wai ka aku no no e te wai ka ni no kuwa u kia wai hold. Bona wai ke ona no kuwa u te ona no wai ama mama o te na u te e ha e ha i te au ki. Aku mai o kuku a mama ua la la kuwa i te au. Aku no no ua la la no no ua ama mama ua ke au te au ko hava i pai ai na. Na kuwa i a no no a kuwa bo kuwa na na ua ke ana na ku kai li mo ku. E na i te po e hava i ka no no e te ana na ku e te e mu na 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 i ke ana na i te au. You rebuke the seals of the heart. Lengthen illegal occupation in our country, our land, our island. Rebuke our boastfulness of ancient gods. Open up all the seals that have been placed here by ancient gods, by foreign gods, by foreign occupations. No, 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 I can't deny it. Oh, my, the poor people in the court. I am a Kalania. I tell you, no, no, no. Oh, 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 Rise up the heirs, the living heirs. Rise up the heirs of the four corners of all this property. Wipe your heirs of Ka'anohe. Kane and all the living heirs standing here. You rise up their bloodline. Rise up their bloodline. Ya mama ite aku kai limo ko heva no no ike ana na ite awa. O na na yo haya wa kana na wa la la ke ana na wa alu nu ya haya mai mai ko 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 no no awa. Ya ya kai luna mo ku ai ka pu ko ko no no ite au ka no ite kai po kai ke ana na ki ala. Holo he ya oi e mai ka po e po e e mai ka po e po e ana na ite a kai po e po e ai ke aku no no ite au. Yo le me ai. In this time of the spiritual restoration of the living heirs, God brings up all the living heirs, all the living people today of the royal pattern that belongs here. The royal pattern of Kane, the royal pattern of Ka'anohe. The living heirs are here. They are here. They're not gone. The bones are not dead. We are not relocating nobody. We are repossessing what rightfully belongs to our people. Yo. Yo. That Yo. every ancient prophet, Pana Eva, Kuka Ilimoku, Ahiau, Makanao, Kane, Ku, Pana Law, you rebuke our foreign entity. And anyone who thinks they are going to build, an illegal entity of exploitation of these lands. The gods will rise and come to your houses. Hono, hono kea. Aole pono, pilau heva oi. Hono, hono kea. 
the blood is returned to you and your family. To you corporate whores who choose to fornicate and, and completely Hana Ino, our people? Ever no! Ever. Today, the gods who purge this land raise up all the ancient councils because the living heirs have made claim. You have made claim in the courts to take on these fornicators of deception. You have made claims and the gods will walk with you when you go into Ew. the court. Ew. I have dedicated all your papers already to the ancient councils to rebuke Ew. all who want to think they are going to exploit our country and the sacred lands to Hana Inu stealing of water from our sacred Bahipanas. They will not do this thing because the gods go all accountable to being fraudsters, fakers, and fornicators of the lands of the rightful heirs. So with this, we now rededicate This is what you call unif unification. It is an act of war. We stand together to rebuke the adversary. Ew. 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 That is our job as living heirs. Ew. Ew. May the ancients walk with you when you go into the courts. Because we will be founded bahus from our end. Here the baby spoon stop, man.
the Indians are here to guide us. Don't stop fighting. Never happened. Never happened. Even in death, we don't stop. Let's move. Let's do this. Shaka boom boom, this action. <laughs> Mahalo. Thanks for walk with each and every one of you. Mahalo. We are privileged to be asked to come and to kokua what we can. Because your fight is our fight. Your fight is our fight. We rise up the gods, we rise up the ancient and the sacred councils that we can find the peace that gotta be in our country. This is all about us, all of us, right here, all of us. If the heirs are not protected, then nobody is going to be spared. You? You. You. We cannot have people thinking that they are going to do what they are going to do. That is not going to happen. So the gods are going to walk with you guys in the pots. They are going to address the pots. They are going to address all of the Mono yeah, Village Corporation. That is our work that we do. Yeah. And we are glad that everybody is here doing what we do. The land has been sanctified and reclaimed. Oh, yeah. Repossess it. Yeah. No matter who's on top, it's who owns it. Yeah. We as living heirs own it now. Mahalo for oh, all you guys work. The children and everything. Mahalo for what you guys do. Okay. 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 Aloha Kako. I am here on behalf of my ancestors and the Kanaka Maoli community. I am here to express the creation and development of the Honokia Surf Village is a frivolous use of our resources in the middle of a water crisis. The use of injection wells is a complete desecration of the ancient karst systems and burials below. The blatant disregard for our ibi kupuna is happening on every mokupuni every day. Our Maui survivors are still left with no true resolution. Our kupuna on every mokupuni is being unearthed for commercial fun. Kapukaki is still being defueled as we speak. It is now more than ever we must remember what it means to be Tanaka Maoli. Yo! Yo! On behalf of Nakia Iol Vaiha, our court hearing will be on February 28th and we welcome you all. Please join by Zoom. We will have the link on our website, nakiaiovaiha.com. We are requesting summary judgment in a lawsuit that we are the plaintiff against the Honokia development. We are here today to raise awareness, to educate the community of the desecration upon the lands of Kekau Onohi. Oh! As you see before you, the people here, we are Kanaka Maoli. We understand what that means. And I hope that as we move forward with these actions, many Kanaka Maoli will see this and understand what it means for them as well. We would love to see each of you standing with us uh, via Zoom or in person. Uh, we are a coalition of Kanaka Maoli who have come together to protect the elemental resources throughout our Pai Aina. We are protectors of Vai, Aina, Ivi, and all that is sacred to the Kanaka Maoli people. Ew. 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 There was a complaint filed in the First Circuit Environmental Court challenging the state of Hawaii's community development authority which is also known as HCDA. HCDA had received approval and 95 million of funding of bonds in order to facilitate this development. Ever! 
There will be water that will be injected into the karst systems here. Injection wells, as stated, is not an environmental friendly use of water or waste water. We come here today to raise the awareness for the world to recognize that water is life. Ew. Evie Ew. is sacred. Ew. Ew. And our Aina is living. Ew. Ew. And for that reason, we stand here to protect all that is sacred that Coop. may be eh. desecrated by this development. We ask for your kokua, your kako'o, your mana to protect all that is sacred for our people. Mahalo ya oko. Aloha, I'm Helani Sonora Pale. I am with the Oahu Water Protectors and I'm also a member of Nakia Iowaiha. I stand here today in protection of this place, the sacred place. Um, we are opposed, strongly opposed, to the building of another wave pool on this island. There is a wave pool less than a mile away from here. There is a surf spot couple miles away from here a famous surf spot here on the west side of the island this wave pool that they want to build will be five acres large and will have will require seven million gallons of fresh potable water oh wait during a water crisis that was caused by the US Navy Red Hill spills there are burials on this area on this on this area that they want to build this wave pool. There are karst cave systems and as Trina had, or Ka'ioleni had stated, they want to inject the used water from the wave pool into the karst cave system. Oh, wait! Which is all connected with each other and it's also connected to the ocean. Less than a mile away is Oneula, which is the bed this, the, a very important limu bed here on the west side of the island that feeds the whole leeward coast. So we stand here, um, we're here today to occupy this space, um, to bring attention to what's happening here. This issue is not over. Ew. It's just beginning for us because we will not stand by and watch another wave pool be built on this aina. Ew. So we will be here for a few days occupying space, and this is the first of many occupations we plan. Yo, yo! Do what it takes to make sure that this wave pool is not built. Whatever it takes. This, it's really up to us as the Kanaka, as the native people of this land to be the voice of our Ivi Kupuna yo. here on yo. this property, be the voice of the Vai, and be the voice of this land. So today, our announcement is we are going to be here till Sunday. We will have educational workshops here. We plan to raise awareness. We plan to build support, build power for my our night. movement to stop this development. Because we refuse, we refuse to sit on the side and let more desecration take place. Absolutely. Ew. Ew. We are done. And we will continue to stand here as many times as we need to until this project is finally stopped. So um, we hope that the community will come out and join us. We'll be here till Sunday. We'll have workshops on the significance of this place, storytelling about the stories and the historical, rich historical history of this place. Right here on this road is an ancient Hawaiian pathway. They built a road on top of it. So we are here to bring back what needs to be brought back, to protect what needs to be protected. Yeah. To stand when, when we need to stand for what is important to us. This is our vai vai. Ew. Ew. This is our gold. Ew. Ew. As Kumu Mike Lee said, this is our gold. Ayo. Ayo. This is what we value. This is our riches, and we Stop will not the desecration. let Ayo. any more desecration take place. We are done. So we will be here till Sunday in peaceful occupation, 
and uh, we ask everyone you know to come by stop by join us um, let's let's build we have um, we are building a, an international a global coalition with groups around the world this is not just happening here in Oahu on Hawaii in Hawaii they're building wave pools all over the world Britain has eight abandoned wave pools the, it's an issue that's not just happening to us, but it's happening all over the world. So we're building a global coalition with other protectors um, that are standing against the wave pools. And I did send that in our press release, um, the statement from, and that's building. We're getting more and more signatories every day. We do have a petition online at nakiaeoiha.com. Please sign our petition to stop this desecration and to protect our aquifer. Mahalo. Anything else? Okay, questions. I got to do an interview on the side after. That's sure. Okay. Yeah, it's a little more production so cleaning though. Done. Any, any questions? Yeah. But they wanted you guys to say your name because sometimes the editor guys can't spell oh, Okay, it. my name is Helene Sonoda Pale. H-E-A-L-A-N-I-S-O-N-O-D-A hyphen Pale, P-A-L-E. Aloha, Payulani, like princess, K A I U L A N I, Kiko Pau, Wahine, Kayulani, Ventura Wong. Spelling, we got the spelling? Are we good? Okay, thank you. Can you spell your last Hawaiian name? They didn't catch it. We're good. Spell for you, Lenny. We're good. All set. Lava. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and then um, if you guys are looking here, that's a map of the cultural sites. The burials. So this is a map of the projected pro um, project area. There is a burial mound here, H18. There may be more burial mounds. Um, this was a known area for burials. So this is um, actually was part of the environmental assessment. So that's where we got this map from. Can you say where we are? Where are we now? Well, we're about here. So this is the ancient pathway. So, um, and the pathway, and this is a very old pathway that goes right through this, that went right through this road. So this is the road here. This we is are where? About here. Okay, we're right there. Yeah. Where are they going to develop? This whole area. Red, everything in the red. This whole area will be developed. Oh, so that? No, it's this way. Okay, so you can. Yeah, it's like a triangular. So that's lot. not north and south. That's uh, more like <laughs> this is. Oh, it is like that. Yeah, so you would have to turn it twice. <laughs> so we're more down over there then, right? Uh, if, if, if this, we're this here. Way. I go on the other side, I can say exactly yeah. where we are. We're right about here. So, so it's in reverse is all he's saying. Oh wait, sorry. No, backwards. you know what? Yeah, sorry. This is the road right here. Okay, I'm looking at it upside down. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so this is the road. Yeah, this is this is where we are. Okay. So it's here, and then the burial mound is here. These are all the cars systems. All of this can be found on our website under the environmental assessment for more details. Um, this was based on, of course, the developer. So. We all have to do our due diligence. Just because it's presented doesn't mean it's all there. So there may be some inadvertent finds with EV. We won't know until people get in there. And that's why we're here is because we don't want to get to that, that point where we come across EV, EV Kukuna. Mm -hmm. Go. I'm just going to show this now. Okay. Oh, show that. Ooh, I love you. So this is a map of the ancient trails. Um, can you see a barber's point here? The barber's point. Yeah. Right here. Yep. So we're right here. So this is the whole area of development. This is the road, right, that we're on. But this is an actual map. It's an overlay of a, it's overlay over now, but it's an old map from 1825. These are the ancient trails. Sorry. The ancient trails run right through here. This is the ancient trail right here. So there, this place has a lot of historical significance and it is 
a place that needs to be protected. It's not just about the water, it's also about the historical significance of this place. This was a battleground and it's part of the Lena. So this is where the spirits wander. And our connection to Kapukaki, to Red Hill, there is um, a pu'u, shoots, pu'u lono. There's a lena um, on Kapukaki, and that lena, the spirits walk west, it walks right, they walk right through here. So this is a pathway for um, the spirit world, for our kupuna to walk through. But this is an old, um, an old map of the actual ancient trails that run through here. And I just like to make known that um, right next door to us is actually a cultural heritage park. So the significance in this place can be attached to what's right next door. There is a, one of our oldest historic villages, possibly the first uh, that originated from Tahiti came here to this area. So if you're watching, Kalailoa Heritage Park is, has a lot of burials. And it's hard to believe that a fence merely separates that village from this area. And we have to believe that our kupuna did not just congregate over five acres over there and they did not come here. Um, and that's why we're here is to protect what is sacred. And that affirms that this place is sacred. We don't want a Disneyland next to a cemetery for our kupuna. Mahalo. You know, so the, there's multiple issues here. We have the that's on this proposed site. The terrible use of fresh water. While meanwhile, if they're going to use seven million gallons of fresh water to fill in a five-acre wave pool. Meanwhile, three miles away, that way, there are families that are experiencing contamination in their water. Still yet. Um, are having rashes and having um, illnesses and they are having to depend on bottled water. Uh, and then literally a mile away is another rain pool that charges um, a high amount of money for someone to actually utilize the rain pool uh, more than I could afford. And then, like 0.6 miles away from here, is a beach. And on this side of the island, we are near to where some of the best surf on the island is. So all of this doesn't make sense in terms of protecting our future, in terms of protecting what's important and sacred. It just only makes sense if you're about making money. So we're here to keep raising awareness. Um, I feel like, this is really about holding the space and educating people, um, educating the community. And, um, I was, we literally were here for five minutes and someone came to us, someone stopped and came over, an Eva resident, and started crying because this was heavy on their heart too. Mm. 
this development is something that a lot of Eva residents are opposed to. And a lot of us Kanaka are opposed to. And so it's just heavens on so many levels. So I think raising awareness, building power, getting um, people to sign on to the petition, getting people to show support and solidarity. And just showing solidarity would be super important. And, um, and that's why we're holding space, just to bring attention to this issue. We do have a court case coming up in February on the 28th. It's on Zoom. We've asked for a summary judgment from the judge on um, our, our complaint that was filed in the So we I feel we have a really good case. I mean, it's like layer upon layer of reasons why we shouldn't build this way. as a Kia'i, right? What brought me to be a Kia'i? And I believe that's going to matter for our children and our grandchildren in the future. I believe that's what brought me here to become a Kia'i and to join forces with Na Kia'i Ovaiha. Who laws specifically here in the Eva Moku is important to me and it holds a special place in my heart because there is times as a child that I spent out here going to the beaches out here, being on the wall when I was high because it helps, you know, medicinally for birth. So many things I can think of. The mo'olelos that I was told as a child. Our ohana living here, yes, that, that is my great grandmother, um, but she was younger. I wasn't even thought of then. <laughs> You know, in her young days, just enjoying the beauty and what Pu'uloa had to offer. And all I can imagine is that I would love to see the same happen for my children in the future. I mean, I would love to see it for myself, you know, but it takes this right here. It takes people who care about Pu'uloa to stand up and say, you know, this is enough. <laughs> and, you know, I, I cannot get over the injection wells. I mean, there's so many things. Wrong. Like Helani said, so many levels of heva that is going on here, the bay that is being desecrated, the burials. If you just do the research, your own due diligence to find out these karst systems that we are talking about, the burials that are located here in these areas, I mean, it amazes me that we can disregard someone who is not here because we have forgotten, right? I cannot say I have forgotten, but People have forgotten and we have lost the true meaning of honor, aloha, you know, upholding, I want to say respect and honor for um, the people who have come before us to allow us to exist today. If somebody did not love Uloa before, there would be no Uloa to be here to be had. If someone didn't love you know, stop and take care and do their thing then, a hundred thousand years ago, whatever time you want to choose, there would never be all of this waste. And I want to add on to the hundred and thousand of years that has already gone by, and I want to make sure that before I go, we all try our best to as well as the rest of all of our Hawaii. Yeah, of course, of course. So uh, this is going to be like the third water park element in a wave pool here. The first being the water park, 
the first one did the white high and then the second the second third wing one. So what I wanted to say is that the organization is a big one. And so you know we have solidarity as well with those around the world. Not only the way full that they're going to initially fill, uh, one of the international uh, wave pools, they said in two years they've had to refill the entire pool five times. So, Waikai initial fill, not including condensation refill on the daily. And again, according to the weather where you're at, so you know, it's very sunny and right, more evaporation. But um, it's 5 million gallons to fill. This one is going to be 7 million gallons to initially fill. And on top of that, you have, it's called, a, it's, they're planning a village. And so they're not, they're in addition to the wave pool, they're planning other features, uh, eating establishments, a conference, a aquatic center, you know, other skate or sports events or areas, and also bungalows which the HCDA, you know, just in the past meeting amended to accommodate for bungalows because technically the amendment as it was, the rules, it would not allow for this type of uh, building to happen here. And so you have to think of if you're going to have eating establishments or even wait for to wash your hands. So water is going to be used not only in the pool, but all around on the concept. And so again, this is uh, fresh water. People are thinking, well, why don't you use salt water, you know, or use natural water. It's fresh water. And like Dr. Hanani said, to be stress it again, that there's still 60,000 gallons of coal that, that we could not take out by, you know, gravity. In addition to the sponge that they're not using the there. So uh, what the last thing I wanted to say is that wave pool have been open, you know, have have been open before. and then two years later and so what then are you going to do you know and in addition to that in addition to that the uh, used water and the general rounds and again so it's a whole ecosystem and you can say that yeah but there's a way to but this is specific area is the karst system yeah the k-a-r-s-t the car system which hasn't been extensively studied one, due to the cultural element yeah, and that it is about the place, you know, to like bury the uh, EB. And so it hasn't been completely, you know, studied. And so it already has been affected with the first wave pool. Now we're going to have this proposed second one. So you have to also, you know, really look into wave pools and the opposition well, just, that there is, you know, that's happening worldwide. And so, especially on an island, the most isolated and landmass, you have to really protect your No, okay, never mind. I don't mind. If you don't have this, I just want to mind. No, 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 no. You don't mind. And what if they sell it? Ooh, 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 what if they sell it? So what, what I gotta talk about? What, mm -hmm. what did you hear? What would you like what to say? What brought you here? What compelled you to come? Is it oh. um, something sparking you? Did, what did you, what in your spirit has brought you here? You know, um, where is, oh my gosh. UH. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, so I'm a UH student, um, actually, um, yeah. And uh, you know, my auntie was the one that brought me here. Um, and when she first told me about it, well, the biggest issue too, because born and raised on the beach, um, we all knew the whole Waikai thing was coming up. And everybody in Eva knew it was that. Everyone knew. And we all tried in our power to stop it, and it looked, it's still, it's 
today, you know? And the funniest thing about it is you're right, it's like $200 to get in. Yeah, and it's only for like an hour or something. Yeah, it's expensive. And you gotta bring it on board. No call me on that. Okay. But um you know like a lot of local families, you know, we use it because can bring the kids, right? Can hang out and whatnot. Cool. But then when you start realizing that all of this stuff is built on sacred ground, you know, that the salt flats that you were mentioning, you know, was desecrated. You're talking about, you know, hundreds and thousands of years of this all being here now gone forever right so to me you know when when us people in Evo knew about it we everybody rallied up and like i said it, it still went on and um you know as a journalist too like i try to um bring up these issues and be like hey guys like we're rallying up but we need our legislative to also be a part of this you know the people can say and speak whatever but it's gonna be up to our policy makers to really put their foot down and be like, you know what? Let's advocate for our people, you know, because we make the body up of this state, our precious state. And I was actually learning about Maui too, and I know that the area used to be, um, I guess had like waterfalls and marshland and stuff it was beautiful. I don't know what the area is called, but yeah, there was like a, a baseball field or something now. And it, yeah, and it's just run down. Nobody take care of it. It's unmaintained. And I just like, I get emotional because I'm like, wow, you know, you spent all of this money, you come here to our Aina, you spent all this money, and then you don't take care. You know, you just come, you spend your millions of dollars, and then you leave. You know, and what is, is that gonna happen to Wai Wai Kai? I don't know gonna happen here I don't know I hope not you know but it's the people your voice is the most important to get everybody to pay attention like hey guys you know our community if you guys keep acting up thinking well it doesn't it doesn't pertain to me or I'm not from I'm Maui I'm not I'm not local or, I'm not local enough all of this is gonna be taken away from my life right underneath me and that's one thing that I'm learning growing up, you know, my family from the plantation, you know, and seeing all the sugar mills closed down, that's, that was like a real rude awakening, you know, and what they did with that and the way that they even treated our kupuna that have served and worked this community so hard, the way they treated them is like, whew, kind of like get into it, but you know, so I mean, this is, this is really important what you guys are doing. Um, you know, that's me. I really hope that the whole the whole state hears about it. You know, because the more voices, the more push you guys are getting from the government to really take a stance. You know, like look at Lahaina, right? No one knew it's a small town in Maui. Right? Everybody knew a small town in Maui. Who's that, right? But everybody spoke up. Everyone ran. We had hundreds come out, right? To wear their shirts and like, it's just chicken skin moment. It's because it's the people. Yeah. And the one thing too about Hawaii is that like, it's all of us, right? Like, Ohana and Aloha, it's, it's all of us. So, we just gotta take care of each other, take care of our family. Yeah. Okay. Or, um, just make sure to take care of what is I'm so glad that the next generation is here. Because you're. Yeah, as much as I like to say I'm next generation from my Kupuna, but you're the next generation of that. There's how many generations already living right now? And we're in the seventh generation prophecy. And if nobody's aware of the seventh generation prophecy, go Google it. Seventh generation prophecy. So it is it is prophesied across many Aboriginal nations, countries, regions that um, the seventh generation would be the one that returns everything back to peace, harmony, and balance, the oneness of all existence that was given to us from the onset. And we, um, through the demise of the power and power, um, over here from college, and, you know, I'm so, so honored to be in the midst of those who are uplifting what we're doing because you're going to be here. You're, you're already holding that space. But yeah. to be the Kia'i in itself, you guys are going to be there. But it's shown by the example of what's established now. And that's what's important. If we yeah. stop doing it, what's going to teach the next generation how to protect us?
right? If we don't do this, who is teaching the next generation of what it means to be sacred? Or hold and uphold things that are sacred because that is where cultural practice of all aspects are held. Somebody has to practice it. And if nobody's practicing it, what is going to be left for the kids to know? I come from a lot of Kahuna lines. Um, my bloodline comes back to Pa'au and Pili. Um, I'm a direct descendant of Pa'au, which is a high priest. And um, there's times in my spirit that I get a little like disgruntled because that cultural practice, I have to learn from the spirit realm because nobody here from my Kahuna bloodline On a deeper level, my, my spiritual kahunaism comes from somebody teaching me. There's nobody to teach me. And so, this right here is teaching the next generation in your media through all of this. It's teaching the next generation what does that look like so it never dies. You cannot let this protect their space just disappear. So, come on. Aloha everyone, my name is Helani Sonora Pale. I am here at Kalailoa um, at the proposed site for the second wave pool here on Oahu. And we are here holding space tonight. Uh, we'll be here till Sunday. Uh, today we had a press conference and we also um, made an announcement, you know, about our commitment to protect this place. Uh, that has burials, uh, karst wave system, uh, karst pool system, and a um, a very storied history. Um, so, I'm here with Wayne Tanaka, and Dwayne is from uh, originally from Hawaii, uh, Mauna Loa, right? Uh, yeah, Mauna Loa and Heia. And then now in Heia, yeah, great. And then Wayne is a water protector, right? So, um, we just wanted to pick your brain, right, um, education-wise, um, to, then that's why we're here, that's the other part why we're here at Kalailoa, um, camping out here on the side of the road, is we want to educate people on the issue, um, why we're here, why we're going to be standing here for the next two days, um, but, you know, for us, um, the water issue is really important here on Oahu because of what happened with Red Hill in 2019 and before that in 2014 with the spills that happened as a result of the U.S. Navy negligence. So um, I wanted to ask you, so what is the state of our aquifer now? Um, you know, we're in, a, we're in a space of a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, there is a contamination plume uh, from the Red Hill facility that uh, is moving in ways that we can't predict. Uh, we don't have a good groundwater model. We don't have a good uh, contaminant transport model. Um, and, and so, and, we're, and as a result, we can't turn on some major wells that would otherwise serve about 400,000 people um, from Mauna Loa all the way to Mauna Loa. Ma Moana Loa to Mauna Loa, and, um, and, and, and as a result, we're depending on other wells, which aren't designed to be you know, pumping as much as they are now, and so we have to watch those wells for water quality changes, like saltwater intrusion and so forth, because that would result in uh, even bigger challenges. Um, you know, you know, beyond, you know, beyond that, you know, we're also dealing with much other problems, right? So we have, um, you know, prolonged droughts, like you know, historic droughts that, um, you know, have really dampened aquifer recharge. Our native watersheds, which are these really amazing um, groundwater recharging machines, are being in impaired by uh, invasive species. Um, and so there's a lot of uncertainty. And, 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 you know, if we're not very mindful of how precious our water resources are, um, we may be looking at some very difficult decisions as to, you know, what we put our limited water uh, how we use our limited water, whether you know, like, which we need for uh, pretty much every aspect of life, you know, our, our, you know, not just water for drinking, and, and but for you know, um, you know, for our, you know, our, our hospitals, our schools, our, um, you know, our, our businesses, our tourism economy. I, I mean, it's if we lose our water, then we lose everything. 
Would you characterize the situation we are in now as a water crisis here on this island? Oh, uh, and why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, absolutely. We are, um, we're just, we just don't know. Like, we know El Nino is coming around, which means it's going to get very, very hot. Water demand is, is going to go up. Um, we are looking at um, like a, a housing crisis, um, which means, you know, we need to figure out ways to house people, but that in itself will, will take water, right? Um, uh, and and as far as we know, to replace the wells that are now shut down uh, because of the Red Hill incident, you know that process will take five to seven years uh, if we can even find um, you know uh, appropriate and safe places to develop new water sources, new wells, and millions of dollars. Oh yeah, and millions and millions of dollars. Yes. Okay, so I, I wanted to I wanted to make this really clear is that um, you know water is an issue on this island and having a building a wave pool that will use seven million gallons of potable water um is a real issue i today's news i watched it for a little while um brian kilana's response was that they were probably not going to use fresh drinking water but that was actually the argument that waikai used to get their permit pushed and then at the last minute they said, oh, after much studies, we cannot use brackish water because of the machinery, right? It, it wouldn't... Um, the rust. And yeah, do you know anything about um, that? I mean, what is your... Do you know, like, brackish water? Do you know of any wave pools that use brackish water or... Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big in the wave pool scene, so I, I unfortunately don't um, don't know if there are any that use brackish water and how they are able to, um, you know, do so in a way that doesn't require like a massive amount of maintenance um, because you know salt and metal don't, don't really mix together very well. Mm, interesting. Okay, so um, okay, so my next question is about the karst cave system um, that is really prevalent here in this side of the island. Um, can you share what you know about the karst uh, system? Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a it's a very unique system. It's um, you know it's it's something that's been studied. There's uh, there's all kinds of uh, I mean very special things about about the car the you know car system in the Everplains. Um, uh, you know which which for me is you know why would you take this like priceless like extremely uh, precious and unique uh, you know, subterranean system, and then use it as a dumping ground, you know, for for your wastewater. Um, it's it's also, you know, my understanding, you know, hydrologically uh, very closely connected to the near shore environment, and so anything we put in there into the car system, it will end up in our near shore waters, which you know, as we know here in Eva, are particularly renowned for uh, their limo beds, like historically and, and currently, and and so you know, there's um, you know, again a, a potential. Uh, threats uh, from discharge uh, that might compromise the integrity of limo beds and then all of the you know subsistence practices the cultural practices um, um, all the things that, that are, are, are tied to that as well as you know the, the fish and, and the ecosystem that depends on you know our native limo species yeah so do you think um, it's a good idea to inject quote unquote treated pool water into the car system I mean what would that do what are some of the um, in your opinion what is what would be some of the things that we might see if that happens oh uh, I mean you know beyond just the I, I'm not sure what the right word is but just you know the fact that we're using this um, priceless um, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, and very very unique car system as, as, a, as a dumping ground you know like my, my concern of the impacts to the unique um, like life that may exist on that exists on there um, you know we have all kinds of like like, like um, uh, studies about this the shrimp shrimp and other, other life um, forms that, that exist in this very unique habitat um, and then also impacts uh, as I mentioned to um, you know, the near shore environment, like uh, the 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 um, brackish water systems that support pretty much the, you know the building blocks for uh, uh, you know the larger environment. Um, you know uh, the limu and and, and the the datoms that feed you know the kala and the and, and anai and, and all the other fish that people depend upon, as well as the limu itself. Um, and then the you know the cultural practices, um, the family practices, all those things that. Um, 
tie people to to this place and, and to the Aina, and, and that can remind us of how connected we are um, on a broader scale to to um, you know the environment, like you know, um, the, the things that we actually really very much depend upon, and will need to do so even more as we navigate the, the climate crisis. So, do you know if the car system is connected to the um, aquifer? Uh, um, I mean, the, the, I, I, based on the definition of aquifer, I mean, the, the car system would, you know, be part of the aquifer. It is part yeah, of the aquifer. Much, in terms of uh, how the water flows, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with the, uh, you know, those hydrologic, uh, uh, hydrogeologic uh, activities, I would assume that, I mean, there would definitely would be, you know, you know connections to the ocean. Uh, to near Shawalas here in, in Eva, Pulo. Nice. Um, I like what you said about the car system here in Eva being the building blocks like of life here, like of the ecosystems. And that's really true because if you disrupt, and, and when you talk about ecosystems, like if you disrupt one part of it, it really, it's going to affect like all different aspects of it. You know, like if you disrupt the car system here, then it's going to affect the limu there and the fish that feed on the limu and so it's kind of like a like a domino effect right almost right yeah and you know i think that's what this situation really um illustrates or, or um you know what we really need to reflect about on is is all these things that we've kind of forgotten right we've forgotten how c connected we are um to the aina right you if you you contaminate the aquifer then people get poisoned like if you have PFAS and PCBs in the, in, in the ocean and people eat the fish then you have that stuff in your bloodstream you know um, and like if you uh, you know pave over or destroy the, the the land the soil that you can that would feed you then you starve um, and, and so um, really what you know I think the situation kind of illustrates is the inflection point that we are as 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 you know people of Hawaii and as humanity and I think you know it's really important for the people of Hawaii and because what happens here will affect the rest of the island and that's the thing about living on an island right so understanding like all the connections that the water how the water moves we don't even fully understand how the aquifer and the water moves in the through the aquifer um, so I think it's super important um, for us to become educated on these issues and topics and learn about these things because when projects like this are proposed and they're proposing to use injection wells that will use that will put the treated water back into the car system um, then we need to understand what that's going to mean not just now but like how that will mean in the future so one of the things we did was we hired a hydrologist to study you know, what would happen um, because what you're doing is you're putting more contaminants in the underground water. Um, and he found that it would reach the ocean in I think approximately 25 years. Uh, but 25 years <laughs> is 25 years, you know, that's, our children's generation and so they'll have to deal with something that you they'll have to deal with that situation so I just think that when when you're talking about systems like this you're also talking about like a long-term the long-term plan of the future for Hawaii and the people that live here and I would also say you know like it, this is an opportunity to reflect um, again on like remembering the preciousness of life and, and of, of, of water that sustains all life and all aspects of life and and you know what kind of precedent are we setting or, or, or perpetuating um, when we utilize this precious resource um, for you know uh, commercial gain and, 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 and really that's that kind of exploitation um, has been you know is recognized as, as, as the source of some of the you know the greatest existential uh, crises of human existence yeah yeah. Um, so, um, is there anything else you want to add about the the water or? 
um, situation. I'm um, just wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, just uh, again, just thinking about what lies ahead, right? Like the the world that our children will inherit. Um, we know it's going to get worse. We know that we've taken too much carbon um, from the ground and put it into the air. That we are not going to get any kind of equilibrium for centuries. And so, you know, the the droughts we've been seeing, the super storms, like all those things will. Um, will, you know, will inevitably continue, even if we stop, you know, burning all fossil fuels like today. Um, and so, th for us, that that it puts it on us to think about, okay, how are we going to build a resilient and healthy future? Uh, uh, here in Hawaii, knowing um, what's happening with our with our you know our groundwater recharge, seeing what's happening to the places we import our food from, um, we really need to think about. Um, you know, for me, three things: why, like water and, and the source of life, um, aina, which that which feeds, um, mm -hmm. physically, spiritually, um, and we also need to think about kaiaulu, um, mm -hmm. our sense of, of community and, and connection, our social fabric. Because um, when the disasters come, as they will, it's really going to be on us to, to remember to take care of each other mm -hmm. um, and, and and to carry each other through you know the tough times ahead. Um, and and un unfortunately, you know, I think with this situation we're doing here, it's the exact opposite of the, of the thinking we need, right? Like, um, you, you know, using water um, not, you know, for the entertainment of the, of the rich, you know. Um, right. um, threatening our food sources, our lingo beds, and all of, 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 the, of, the, of the food that that supports. Um, and then, yeah, and then like, you know, um, just totally disregarding the, the community. Um, on Oahu, that's right now facing some very uncertain uh, situations with our, with our, with our water security. And, and, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for putting it in that perspective because it's really not just about Kalailoa, it's really about everyone that lives on this island and, and drinks water from the same aquifer. So, thank you for coming and thank you for holding space with us. Um, and this is what this weekend is really about is just kind of like getting more information and educating the public and you know refining our understanding of what this project will do if it if it's allowed to move forward right to not just our natural and cultural resources here in our Ibi Kupuna but for our future thank you thank you Wayne thank you thanks, thanks for sure. coming um, and make sure everyone signs our petition. Uh, it's on our website, nakiaiowaiha.com. Um, uh, we had 300 signatures today. That was great. Um, we just started the petition. Uh, and so we had a really successful first day of uh, occupation here at Kalailoa. Aloha, everyone. Surf Village complete with a surf pool with using 7 million gallons of our fresh water and um, desecrating it will end up desecrating our Iri Kupuna which are buried here behind us as well as destroying important carscape system that is part of a whole fragile ecological system here in Kalailoa. So I um, want to introduce our president Trina. Aloha Kaiolani, Aloha Mai Kako, Aloha Kakahi Akaya Oko. Um, happy to be here. Please share this live. We're excited to raise awareness for our Lahui. Um, we believe that empowerment is totally important for the next generation. Um, without the future, where will Hawaii be? And so we're just honored to have a special guest today to share her ike and her expertise. Um, and how we can raise that continued awareness within our moku, within our ahupua'as, our ilis, wherever heahala, we, we're, we're in our pai'aina. So um, please share our live and come on down if you guys in the area. Mahalo. Uh, and I want to mahalo kahaka for that beautiful yes, mahalo kahaka. Um, kanipu. Um, and so mahalo yaoi um, e dani i ka hele mayana i ki iawahi. Um, e kako o ya mako, e ki ia no huana o ka aina, um, e ke kia i, um, e ke kia i ana i na iwi kupuna, um, e kawai, a me ke kia i ana, um, 
ike ina um kolohona amena me akanu koma ko ohana ike wahi um so thank you so much for coming and for being here and for speaking on this um on this place and the importance of this place so if we can kind of share and i want to tell my to everyone we are on the side of the road so there will be times where cars and we're actually next to a airport as well cars and planes will be flying or passing by and uh, there will be noise disturbance but it call my in, in advance so if you can tell us about yourself danny and like you know where you're from where you grew up and what you're studying and your ohana yeah, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. i to go to the next one. I'm going to i to in the Moko of Eva, so directly across Kuuloa. Um, and so I, I've been living there with my kupuna for the last maybe 15 years or so. Um, and do a lot of Aina work um, restoring Lo'ikalo out there in Kalawao. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with Her Ridge Center, that area, that Ahupua is actually Kalawao um, and was like famous for freshwater springs, famous for Lopo'ia and Lo'ikalo. Um, so abundant in Vai, as was true of all of Eva, um, that Mo Iwahine Kalani Manuea, the daughter of Kukani Loko, chose to live there um, and is credited with developing that whole um, system, all of those systems. And so we're trying to restore Lo'ikalo um, out on that side, and that drew me into a lot of the Vai movements that you know, we got to develop Pilina on um, because we can't do anything without Vai. Uh, we cannot uh, practice any part of our culture and we cannot live without Vai. Um, and so that kind of drew me in. Um, I'm also in a doctoral program at UH Manoa um, focused on that, focused on restoring um, OEV food systems, specifically spring-fed lo'ikalo in urbanized spaces um, and reconnecting kanaka and aina and looking at what are the effects of health um, and, and why is that good for our community and good for not just aina but also people and how we need we need each other. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mahalo. 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 So, um, so my first question is like, can you tell us some of your work that you're doing at Kuuloa? Um, you know, when you're speaking, I'm sorry, I just got emotional because it's it so important. Yeah, it is. it is. It hits home. You said very yeah. important. What we cannot do nothing without water and we need to make sure there are opportunities for the keiki to be able to engage in that yeah. because that's that's who we are right what you're doing it is <laughs> i'm getting choked up too because spring fed spring fed um lo'ikalo you know i shared in an interview yesterday how important it is to eat of our ahupua'a because that mana is reciprocated to everybody who partakes of it and for us it is our the existence of our mana comes from that reciprocation from vai that comes from you know vakia and it comes through and it just makes its way and it feeds all of us it nourishes us not just physically but in our spirit and and our next generation needs to be able to have those opportunities that our kupuna always um, was their existence you know so mahalo for that service and taking your doctorate in that area because um, it's imperative nobody's making sure that that's available for the next generation so your work will usher in that that understanding to keep in continuity for perpetuity and that's beautiful so mahalo for that that work yeah, yeah. so if you can just share th thank you mahalo china yeah. i know it's just i think it hits home for us as women because of our deep connection with the waters of life as the carriers of the by Ola. So um, I wanted to um, just hear a little bit about you know your work that you do in Pu'uloa. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we have a, I'm a part of an organization called Ho'ola Ho'ya Kalawo. Um, so of course Ho'ola, like 
um, you know, to thrive, to be vibrant, um, and then ho'o, the causative, right, to cause that to happen. Um, and the ho is because I think for those of us who are familiar with this side of the island, um, at least in my age, like growing up in the 80s and 90s, that that severing of Pilina had already begun. Yeah, I didn't grow up seeing Eva as a place of abundance in the way that I realized as an adult my kupuna did. Um, you know, there, all the buildings were there, Purge Center was there, we already knew we couldn't touch the ocean, we already knew we couldn't swim in the streams, the streams are already channelized, the streams are already cemented, and so I didn't see it as a place of abundance. Instead, I was taught that those waterways were dangerous because they could get you sick so we touch them. Um, and so I think for me, even in looking at the last three generations in my ohana, you know, I we found pictures of like my my mom's generation swimming in in our stream before it was channelized or my my grandparents have told me stories of walking down from our house not even a mile to the ocean and just gathering she was like yeah you just stick your hands inside inside the the sand and the lepo and then you get clams and then you go home and you eat um and i was like oh when, when did you folks stop being able to do that she's like oh i don't know like they just started putting up signs saying it's contaminated so you cannot do that anymore um, and so, you know, seeing in three short generations the ability to subsist off of the kai and to subsist off of our kahavai and things like that, to being able to not even being able to touch them. Um, and I think it speaks to your point before um, in terms of, you know, if like if Costco never exists or all of these places, Safeway or whatever, whatever places we see as the places for food. Um, and we really saw Aina as Aina and, and the, the place where we would gather gather food, um, our relationship would look different. Um, if that was the only place I could get Ia, or if that was the only place that I could get Kalo, and these waterways were contaminated and going to run into it, like the, the area that, that our, we live used to be, you know, Lo'i Kalo, like that whole, if you're familiar with um, Waimalu Plaza where uh, like, City Mill and, and Safeway and that whole area, that was all Lo'i before. I have some old maps from um, the early 1900s that shows it in Rice, which tells me that a couple decades before that, it was Lo'i. Um, and then they build that channelized canal on the left side between the elementary school and, and that shopping center um, to be able to build. Yeah, so you, you, you build these canals, kind of like Alawai, you build these canals to be able to dry out Aina so that you can develop and you can build. Um, and so part of our work is shifting, I think, the psyche of our community where for those in my generation and even in the generation before, um, we've developed this relationship with concrete and this relationship with buildings, right? Like I've heard in, I'm, I'm on the neighborhood board in our community, I've heard like, oh, Pearl Ridge is like the heart of our community. I'm like, what the hell? Like that, it's, you know, like that's so twisted. Yeah. We cannot eat concrete. Yeah. Like it's so twisted. How can we have a relationship with a building um, and forget that for millennia, that was all lo'i. The biggest springs in our community sit underneath Pearl Ridge Mall. We have maps of that. Um, the Kahuvai, the Kahuavai <clears throat> sit in that area and that whole side of um, that whole side of the mall was all spring fed Lo'i Kalo and then on the other side it was fed by Kalawal, um, Kalawal Street. Um, and yet we've in a short time think, forgotten all of that and so a huge part of our Hana and it's in our community um, right now is trying to shift that and remind our community that Aina is Aina, like this is still a Hawaiian place. Our, our Inoa Aina are still important and so part of the naming, um, the Mahiai of the space that we were for, Anthony Deleuze, um, he's the one that founded the organization um, years ago. They were intentional to include Kalawau in that because everybody's like, oh yeah, you know, like down by Park City or like down by Parage or down by Aia and those are all false names. Like Aia is an Ahupua'a name but it's the next Ahupua'a over that the city got named because that was where the sugar mill was. And so there are four Ahupua that comprise the city of Aia. Yeah, so you have Palava, Aia, Palawa, and then Waimalu. And that all comprises the city of Aia. And so even like shifting the, the language, uh, like my mom them live in Honoululi, but everybody always talks about only this area as being Eva and not from Halava all the way out to this side. And so shifting that, no, like we're still in Eva on that side. 
there were pilina across these these ahuwa. And yet, on this side of the island, if we look at a map, like our ahuwa are so thin. From my house to the farm, I, I passed two traffic lights and that's two ahuwa. Um, and that was because of the abundance of light in these areas. And so even remembering the mo'olelo of like Kane and Kanaloa coming through Eva with the o'o and yeah. plunging it into the ground so and then planting their ava, it speaks to the springs in our in our area um, and the streams. And there's incredible amount of abundance, but like you said, it's under bridges or under concrete. Um, and it's become, you know, channelized and cemented and diverted. And so in addition to the actual hana on aina and creating a, and holding a space um, for people to come and help to restore, um, it's starting to shift those, those mentalities um, and remind ourselves, you know, similar to what folks in, in Ko'olaupuk are doing, you know, like Maya and um, Kaleo them out at Uko, reminding folks that like, no, Kailua is a Hawaiian place. Like there are all of these mo'olelo, there's a fish pond right under all of this overgrowth. You know, um, that there were over a hundred fish pond in Pu'uloa um, that fed our communities that like just, if you go to the ocean from my house, right, if you, for those who are familiar with where Blaisdell Park is, that used to be a 12 acre fish pond right there called Pa'akea, right, right at the mouth of Waimalu Stream. And if you were to walk less than a mile down the road, there was another big fish pond called Opu that's credited with having been developed under Kalani Monuya. If you walk a mile down the road at quote unquote Magru Point, yeah, there's another fish pond called Pa'ayao. And so there's just such abundance in such a small, a small area that I think a lot of times we forget about. And so I think it's connecting those mo'olelo, um, teaching people how to access them. We have a small hui of folks that we're working on, you know, like uh, developing lo'i with that we're also wanting to show. Because like for a lot of us, I had to go to a, a graduate program to learn how to use the archives. You know, it's so stupid. And that's the only way that I can learn how to, you know, um, access pala pala, access mahele documents, access, um, yeah, the testimonies or like the, um, the, the archaeological dig uh, records and, and all of those things. And it's so backward because how are we going to be able to restore Aina um, in the way that our kupuna saw it? Because it's so different than how, how we see it now um, if we don't have, know how to access and, and to read their words, you know? And I think it's like, it's the setup of the American assimilationist like education system that we're not taught how to do those things. We're not taught that they even exist. Um, and, and how to interpret and connect with our kupuna through um, those types of sources also. Thank you, Mahalo. Yeah. That was, a, that was very deep. Yeah. I'm just sitting here thinking like, wow, you're doing such beautiful work. And I was going to ask, you know, what is the neighborhood board that you're a part of? What are they supporting? Uh, in hopes of maybe restoring, supporting the work that you do in your academic space. Um, can they bridge? Do you see a bridging? Do you see the community asking the neighborhood board um, outcry? Can we restore? What are the parameters? Do you find that the neighborhood board has limited restrictions on what they can facilitate to pako'o or encourage or push through into the city council or whatever um, because it sounds like a beautiful thing that you're doing that we should have going on in every ahupua'a or even ili's like our ohana comes from ho'ai'ai and it's a ili but water ran through it and we're not by oceanside but they had mala by the abundance up there right and so it sounds so beautiful and i would like to see that for all of our keiki to partake in every ahupua'a because it is the mindset that we have to shift in colonization the propaganda came heavy and it really separated us from the truth of who we are and that was done by design because if you can separate us from where what nourishes us what keeps us connected in the ike kuuna hawaii that gets passed from aina kupuna to us then you can kill us off and so how do you see or is it working are there steps between your um, county work or volunteer to your academic can there be a mesh is there opportunities for people with the same desire to restore and can bring that to their count their neighborhood board because if what you're doing is powerful and you know the capacity of the board what could you share to other people to take it to your board these are some things that the board can facilitate because it is necessary. We know it's necessary for our existence, 
to be a part of the aina, to kanu our mana within our ahupua'a. It's imperative, but it's not facilitated. It's not encouraged. I come from DOE, my background is science, and it's not there. If a teacher chooses to incorporate ike ku'u na hawaii, that I mean everything. Yeah, the because the benchmarks come from Amelika. Yeah. The Hawaii content performance standards come from Amelika. And even though they try to incorporate in some capacity, it's very slim. Mm -hmm. And so teachers kind of step outside of that boundary in order to make sure the next generation of not just Kanaka Maoli Keiki, but Keiki who are raised, born and raised here, need to be able to understand because the perpetuity in your service, in your hana, in your academics, comes from making sure the next generation has that in their grasp. And if it's not within reach, it's, I don't want to say it's poho, because I don't believe in that, but we need to bridge that. And, and how sitting in this seat as council, uh, neighborhood board and then your academics where do you see because you hold two hats how can we bring the two together in order to facilitate more work to hold a more for our KP for the future of Hawaii because we need it we, we need yeah. to make sure it's being incorporated so what are your thoughts um, I, sorry I said I'm no 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 <laughs> um, our our board is a bit unique um, I, I'll just say I I'm, I'm going alone in it and so I think like there are other boards that function differently and where you have a, enough people who are of, a, of the same mindset that you can actually effect change. I think right now because I'm honestly the only one that is not pro-development, I'm the only one that thinks from this perspective. Um, I think there are others on the board or in that space that are like um, supportive of like history and legacy and those are the words that are used but it's a plantation history mm. and so like you know like the sugar mill forget knocked out and I'm just like oh my gosh I cannot I cannot <laughs> you know and so it's a struggle to be in that space and I think um, in this last season I've really taken time to reflect on okay like what is my kuleana in that space um, I think there's the opportunity for folks who are or even just show up to the meetings to develop Pilina with the stakeholders and with those who are in positions of power so that if the community has um, something that they want to push through, then those Pilina are already set and then you, it's, it's easier to push it through. Um, so like for example, on the, um, the Red Hill side, we did a lot of organizing on the boards um, to pass a reso, you know, about shutting down Red Hill. Um, and things like that. So, in terms of in terms of the board, like there's no voting power or anything within the government structures. But because the board interfaces at least monthly, you know, with like somebody from the governor's office and the city council and all of these all of these entities, and depending on the community, the entities can shift um, on who shows up. Um, but you get a sense you, it it's an opportunity for me to keep an ear to the ground on on things that would just get passed through if not. You know, and so like in, in our community, a lot of it is tied to development. A lot of it is tied to rail and what they're calling transit oriented development, which is essentially gentrification along the rail line. Um, and the Aloha Stadium, you know, development where they're trying to build freaking hotels and, and shift, the, um, shift the designation to, um, to mix so that they can have shopping, a shopping district and hotels, shift the zoning and all of that. So it's like a, it's an opportunity for me to keep my ear to the ground uh, personally just because of the way that our board functions it's it's unfortunately not an area where i can really push in terms of advocacy like i already the angry hawaiian on the board like i'm <laughs> i'm already that person um and and i'm emceeing that way and i'm the youngest one and you know like all of the things um and so and i'm a woman and you know it, it just functions that way like that's how our, that's how unfortunately our board functions um i think with a enough people yeah it could be a beautiful place like i look at how other like the Y Manalo neighborhood board and how other areas function where um you you can start to start to do more of that um but yeah i think on, on that end it's it's more challenging so it's it's impactful if our people do come to i'm just yeah you know putting it out there it does it make a difference oh, that our absolutely. people show up to the neighborhood board do they continue yeah. to bring their concerns such as this yeah right because where you're at it's cemented already yeah right and this area right here Pu'uloa, 
it, I mean, we got military going on, but there's yeah. this right here. This yeah, if issue. people showed up, if people showed up, I mean, because mm -hmm. the Kulean of the board, right, is to listen to the concerns of the community. And so if the community is showing up and advocating in a certain yeah. way, then it also allows the members of the board who our friends or like you know are like minded to be able to actually say hey no the community is asking for this we need to and to push it that way um and so that's been that's been helpful also um i think so it, it it's like the the strategic yeah on, on the backside like um discerning who who will be the top cover so that the the um what we really want to get pushed through can get pushed through um and that's kind of one of the the strategies you know that we use on the red hill side where it's like okay where we'll be strategic and visit different neighborhood boards a bunch of us will show up will testify and then it'll allow the people on the board who are actually um friendly to what we're trying to push through to be able to advocate and actually say no like the community is saying this um and then it's not an argument among the board that's beautiful because then if a lot of people are replicating that throughout different boards now all these heads of the boards are coming to the, their heads and going, there's a consensus throughout Oahu. Mm -hmm. This neighborhood board reported, this yeah. neighborhood board report, they, it's, they don't want, you know, whatever it is. So it's, I think it's helping our people to empower them where to take their voice, how does it matter? You're doing beautiful work, right? How do we bring that unification? And so thank you for, for helping our people yeah. know that we don't we don't have to be the angry Hawaiian. Yeah. I mean, take your concerns. You don't need to be the only one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I, I just want to announce too that, um, and I'm, I'm think there is going to be a future announcement that um, we do have our first island-wide on Oahu um, position on Red Hill um, that was passed by all neighborhood boards. So that took a lot of organizing. That was two years in the making. Um, that Danny was a part of. I was a part of. Um, we all just kind of took turns. It was like tag team with getting, but the neighborhood boards don't have much power. That's the other thing too. But I, like, like our sister Tara always shows up. But mm -hmm. and, but what I wanted to ask you um, is okay. So Pu'uloa is this is not Pu'uloa, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah so Pu'uloa is over there. So what is the relationship between Pu'uloa and here Kalailoa? Like. How, like, is it near and what is that? What, what does this area look like? How much people were supported in this area, like, of, you know, in this whole Eva Honouli Uli Pu'ulo area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have the, the exact numbers. I can, I can try to pull them up later. But what I was told is that Pu'ulo was essentially the breadbasket for this entire area. And so from Halava all the way to Honouli because we have several, I mean, in English, we call them locks, yeah? Um, we look at Pu'uloa, Yaumalau o Pu'uloa, yeah? The, the, the locks of Pu'uloa. So you have the eastern lock down where, um, on our side, the, the middle lock closer to, like, Waikele, Waipahu area, um, where all of the, the vessels are, on what a lot of the military vessels are now. Um, and then west lock near Kapapapuhi. Um, so if, if you're coming out right across from the hospital, you go in there, um, there's a group of folks um, who are restoring Kapapapuhi and that, that area on that side. Um, and so within that, I remember I found a map one time and, and it had maybe like 40 fish ponds. And so we were talking about it online and then one of the uncles was like, no babe, there were over 100 fish ponds, you know? Because there were also Ohana fish ponds that were all throughout this whole area. And, and if you think about the Mo'olelo with Kane and Kanaloa and that much bay that was coming out of springs leading to the ocean there was there was all of that brackish water yeah and all of that ono that could attract um fish in in this area and so um on this side you know closer to kalailoa um there would have been a relationship as i was as i was in pule um kind of thinking about okay like what what might we share um i just was getting a sense of it as a like um, like just just uh, the encouraging word for you folks is just to I just gonna read read the words of our course. Of course, now. yes, yeah. that would be um, great. That would be so inspiring. And so I, um, they need to be here yeah. at all times, and we need to always reference that for teaching the next generation. Yeah. What does it look like to walk with kupuna, right? Yeah. So yeah, please. Yeah. yeah so this is um, these are just excerpts. Um, 
from uh, the Mo'olelo Hi'iaki Polio Pele. And so this is from when um, she, they're, they're at um, Poka'i and they're getting ready to, they're getting ready to head out. Um, and she is coming, she's, she's going to be traveling on Aina and then, um, let me just find it. They're saying goodbye to, um, to a chiefess, Makua. Yeah, and so Hi'iaki is electing to, to travel overland from Waianae um, through to, to Eva and then, um, and then uh, Wahine Oma'o and Lohi'o are going to be traveling by Va'a. Um, and so she she's kind of explaining, um, they, they start their journey um, and then she's she's describing their return. Um, so she says, Aloha ka hau o ka ala, oia hau, hali hali a ala mau uh, nene, honi au ke kupa o puloa, he loa ka imina e ke aloha e. So he says, Beloved is the dew of Ka'ala, that dew which bears the fragrance of the nene grasses. Kiss the natives of Pu'uloa, who one searches far for love. Right? So that tells me that the, that the, um, the fragrances of, the, um, of this certain, certain mo'u, these certain grasses that grew all in this area. Yeah? So it tells me that the terrain at that time was a lot of lowland forests and, and lowland grass areas. And that the, the, the wind, it, it talks about the connection between Eva and Pu'uloa. There was, I mean, Eva and um, why and I, where where the wind would come through, the wind from Ka'ala would come through um, and blow in this direction. Um, and so it says, preparing to depart from the village of the chief Esmakua, Hiyaka elected to travel overland through Wa and I um, to the heights of Pohakea and across the plain of Honolulu. Hiyaka made preparations for Lohiao and Wahineo Ma'o to travel by canoe from Pokai to the landing at Ko in Honolulu. Before letting them depart, Hiyaka instructed her two companions. As you travel, you arrive at a place where a point juts out into the sea. That will be Lailoa. Yeah, Lailoa. Um, do not land there. Continue your journey forward. As you continue your journey, you will see a place where the ocean lies calmly within the land. That will be Eva. Do not land there. As you continue your journey, you will reach a place where the mouth of the land opens to the sea. Um, that is Pu'uloa. Do not land there. Land there. That is the entryway to Eva. And then from the heights of Pohakea, Hiaka looked out to the shores of Eva, where she saw a group of women making their way to the sea. The, the women were going down to gather papai, crabs, and limu, seaweed, and to gather the mahamoi, o kupu, which are kupe, which are both um, just like shellfish, or small shellfish, yeah. Um, and such things as they could be attained along the shore. Hiaka then began to chant about those ladies. Kamakani kehau o lalo o wai o pua. The kehau breeze is there below wai o pua. Ko ke kula na naila ike kupu kupu. Bearing the fragrance of the kupu kupu ferns across the plain. Moi no kianu o kamau. The coolness is laid upon the grasses. Moya kula ke kaio eva ikianu. A coolness laid upon the sea of Eva. Um, Eva is, is made cold. Eha maue a wamakanine. Because of the fish that hushes voices, be silent in that, in that breeze. Yeah, and so it, it speaks to that i aha mau leo. Yeah, the, the, um, the oysters or the clams that are, that are abundant in Puloa, for which quote unquote Pearl Harbor gets named, right? Um, and the, all of the mo'olelo that are that are tied to that um it says it says anu eva ikai aha mauleo e ha mau hoie eva is is made cold because of the fish that hushes voices be silent um and so it, it goes on to talk about um just the beauty and abundance in in this area but i think like in today's world we see certain distinctions yeah like like this is Used to, I, I grew up knowing this place as Barber's Point and then it, you know, then, then Kalailoa and, and those, those Inoa Aina and Inoa Kupuna um, began to resurface and, and be remembered, you know. But like, there's a distinction between this and then, and then um, the city of Kapule and then Eva Beach and all of these things. But I think the way that our Kupuna thought, um, these resources were all connected. Um, and the way that the wind blew in certain areas and the way that the sea um, sea was was harvested and whatnot. Like, 
a lot of the I think barriers or divisions that we've created through cities or through buildings or through roads and things like that um, I don't know that they saw it that way you know like there is such abundance like the ocean is not that far this way it's not that far this way um, and there is there is incredible amount of abundance um, and so I would imagine that um, there was a koleana also because we also know that you cannot grow food just in the area that you're growing food. Yeah, like my ability, if I had a, a local ia straight this way, my ability to, to have ia in there was contingent on all of the other conditions around it. Yeah, I, I needed to make sure that the vai that was coming out from the, the puna, the, the springs that were emptying into the ocean or the stream that was emptying into the ocean um, was healthy. I needed to make sure that the offshore fisheries were healthy. Yeah, that there was there was limu, um, that there weren't air pollutants that were that were coming in, that the the things that were happening up in the up in the mountains were um, were pristine because all of that affected what I saw in a system. All of those systems were connected, and so I think um, you know I think like sometimes because we unfortunately don't always have the the privilege to be able to steward those like food systems in the way that our kupuna did, we forget that like. Yeah, I can have Aina in this area, but it's not going to be abundant if everything else around it is not cared for and it's not abundant. Um, the reason I was late was because I was, I was caring for my kupuna and I had to, I woke her up before I left. I like She had breakfast and I was like, hey, I go and, I go and see, those, see those folks on, because we saw you folks on the news, the press conference yesterday. I was like, you have any any manao? And yeah. then, you know, of course she was like, oh, no, no, no. I was like, no, like I know you folks always used to come out over here and and holo holo and stuff like that and then so I, I was just kind of trying to prompt her and she I, I like get him right I, I wrote him down um, and she was she was like no it was just it was just so prosperous she said there was so much fish there was so much kala there was so much limu um, there were like turtles like you have everything that you need and and I think for, for her so this grandmother was married to my Hawaiian papa um, and, and she's from Samoa, so she's from Amaoli and, um, and Tutuila in American Samoa. And so I think coming over, you know, like seeing the connections in, at that time in the 40s and in the 50s with being able to subsist on Aina here in Hawaii also. And hearing Olela Hawaii on the buses when she would travel to school and all of that at that time with the kupuna. Um, and so she said, you know, like it was just so, so abundant that it, it felt like all of that was just given to people to be able to live. Um, and she just she was describing it, and she's not a very emotional person, like, but she was describing it with such beauty. And so she, and then she goes, like, why the heck would you? She said, why why would you destroy that? It's so stupid, you know. And and just an uh, encouragement to you folks who are here and and are choosing to be present here, um, you know. She said, just go to the ocean. It's right, it's right there. But but remembering the abundance of um, the resources at that time, and even you know she she talked about the kala and kala feeds on limu you know and the abundance of limu in this in this area and like we said before all of the conditions need to be right in order for all of those things um, to thrive, to thrive. Yeah. Um, and I think you know our government definitely ignores that uh, but I think even even in our communities you know there's so much stuff happening all over the place but I think on the flip side it can feel so overwhelming but I think on the flip side it's also the encouragement that you know like if if we if we are really able to discern okay what is our kuleana what is our lane and I'm just gonna do that all of those ripples together is, is similar right we're caring for these resources we're caring for the different um, the different areas it's I mean whatever metaphor we like use right we can talk about kipuka and the, the throwing of seeds to be able to regenerate um, the forest in other areas if all of these kipuka are throwing seeds then then we're doing that collectively across the board and so yeah just a little pipe pipe to you folks like like this and and for those who are in the classroom and for those you know who are in government or whatever it might be whatever our name is I think like as we really awamo kuleana in those ways and then look up and try see how we can link up yeah. and how we can kako each yeah. other I think that becomes the essential thing that's the biggest pebble in a pond effect that we can create right yeah. is working together because that shift in the collective consciousness of who we are as a people 
is going to come by the collective unity of even though like you said we're in our name but when you connect that yeah. then it becomes like it's everything is impactful i'm not trying to say you know one isn't but when we can unify and bring each other together to kakoho yeah. then we're listening to our kupuna first and foremost right because we cannot we cannot create change you can create change but collectively it's more impactful when we yeah. do it together because we're unifying each other between ahupuas through our kupuna and amplifying that mana together right so yeah mahalo so Danny, may I ask you, um, have you heard and do you know the only for Kalau Kuula? I don't. You don't? No, I can uh, share that and you know how you're saying unifying and I think what, what you just brought up which is super important, the words of you know, only to you know, keeping it alive and so would in your mind would you think that doing the only for Kuula, how it's connected to here, would be a great way to unify people to kind of connect? Absolutely. Yeah, like so I can help. I, yeah, and, 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 and yeah. like Alevo Yeah, like I'm not a I'm not a hula person. But what I learn from folks who have been raised um, in certain traditions is, you know, yeah, there's something about certain hoike and whatnot. But I think like the vai vai and and the ego of it is to be able to speak certain oli or mele or do certain hula in the vahi for the kupuna of those area to hear them and to connect, right? And so that's how we we um, bridge that generational gap, right? The kupuna aina or the kupuna kai as well as the kupuna um, kanaka who have lived in those areas. And I think that's where those generational genealogical and spiritual connections come. So to be able to like, you would like, you know, be able to share, I was able to learn that, that holy. And we can learn it and then we can do it together to really kind of connect. Mm -hmm. That would be beautiful. So I wanted to um, point out the fact that you, um, the stories that you shared, you know, it really speaks to the connecting, connection of everything, kind of like what Tita Ka'iolani, um, Trina said. So, like, the fact that she made the connection from Mount Ka'ala mm -hmm. all the way down to Eva and to um, Pu'uloa, that is amazing because that shows a, a universal perspective of Oahu and our world and how connected it all was, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was, and that's how Hawaiians and, and our kupuna saw this, this place. And so, you know, as a yeah, uh, and a um, tarot farmer, you know. Um, my, I guess my last question to you, I just wanted to point that out, how beautiful that was. Like, it was just, everything was all connected, right? Like, she saw, like, it was as if she, when she spoke of Eva, and she connected it all from Y and I and just one, one olelo. Like, just it's all connected here. Um, so, I guess my question to would be like um you know like what is the work that you're doing um with you know in, through education like mm -hmm. to the next generation and i know you're working with yeah. educating um the next generation i think that's super important yeah. because if we're not perpetuating it then i guess you know it's not then what is our purpose you know so yeah um professional my background is actually in teaching so so Vincent was my student when I used to teach yeah. <laughs> intermediate. I, I was, I, yeah, I used to teach in the DOE intermediate, um, and I since then like have, have pulled out of the classroom and joined this program, um, and since then have been doing more work on the on the flip side outside of the classroom um, and being able to kako kumu who like you're saying right like the law is there. But there's no support to be able to do it. You just gotta do it alone, out of your own pocket, right. figure it out. Buses is like five hundred dollars, um, like all of those, all of those things. Um, and so, I think it's shifted for me personally in the last few years. Like I was working with um, UH College of Ed um, in their teacher preparation program, mm -hmm. and so I think that's a. I don't know that that's a place where I will find a home. Um, 
I mean, no matter what system we're in, right, we're going to be the only ones for a little while yeah. until we can create that space. But I think that's a huge part of it because I, I had colleagues who, you know, were interested, but there's nothing. Like, you can become a teacher and there's nothing that, that you have to learn that grounds you in Hawaii. You know, um, you take that one, if you go to school in, in Hawaii, you take that one, like, 100 level language class that everybody has to take or whatever. Um, and then that's, that's about it. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a key part of it is, is the bridging systemically, the bridging between the policy, right? Because the, the Con Constitutional Convention in the, the 1970s pushed through so that Hawaiian studies and Hawaiian language and there are, there's a value legally for these things, but there's a complete breakdown on the structural support for them um, and since then you know the office of Hawaiian education has formed and then there's all of these in the ha and all, all of this kind of stuff and there are good people trying to do things in pockets you know in those areas but i think there's a breakdown in terms of actually equipping kumu to be able to do that or a value of practitioners you know either coming in or support for students to go into the community yeah. so for example like my last year that i was in the classroom um I used to teach in um, in Waimano, so we wanted to take our students to one of the nearby lo'i in Waiava. It was $1,000 for that field trip, one day, um, because of buses, um, because of site visit fees, which is understandable, like those people need to make a living also. But for one day, so just a drive-by field trip one time. But when I was there, I had students who were Hawaiian, did well in school, but you know, the things that we is not our fault that we consume about what it means to be a, Haw a Hawaiian in the education system. As she was learning about the structure of the lo'i there, she was like, wow, like Hawaiians are really smart, yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, think about it. You need to know all of the science of all of these things, where the springs are, how to orient your patches, how to, where to bring, build your loko ia and all of that. She said, wow. You know, and I think just like seeing that shift for a kanaka, who was taught that Hawaiians were stupid, yeah? Or, or Hawaiians were not the intelligent ones, were not the scientific ones, were not the ones that, you know, were, were poetic or whatever the lie may be. To get to actually see and experience that in action and connect with kupuna in action, I think is, is foundational. And so I think like the creating those opportunities, like we cannot, you cannot make a lesson plan for that. You know, like you cannot you cannot recreate those those things in yeah. a bubble or in a building. You have to be able to take out. And so I think it's a mix, right? There's the training so that, that there are kumu, there's the there's the valuing of kumu who already have that background. We're at the point where, you know, we have um, generations of people who have now gone from Punana Leo all the way through college who can olala hawaii yeah. in the home and so can we value those those folks and then support them yes. to go through school to be yes. able to come become kumu i think there's also the um the like for for us in our community you know like one of my back back burner dream projects is like we don't have a it doesn't need to be a charter school but we don't have a hawaiian place of learning in between like halau kumana in makiki and then there's Wayao, you know, which is a dual immersion campus. Right. Um, and they have a long wait list. Um, and then all the way till you hit Nanakuni. There's a, there's a vacuum in, in the entire moko of EVA. And so can we create um, institutions of learning for parents who choose to put their, their children in there where we can really support our kids so that they can be grounded in the place and not have to get on one bus yeah. and sit in traffic yeah. and go all over the island to learn. Um, from someplace else that's beautiful and it's a beautiful vahi but can we also create more institutions where our kids can be planted right there's dream house and they're doing doing some some great yeah. things but like an actual kula yeah. that is devoted to okay what are the mo'olelo in eva yeah. you know what are the mo'olelo in kukuloa how do we raise our students to to have koleana to this place um, oh i share that yeah. i share oh, that with so you yeah. to create a, a area that will um, specifically target, like for my daughter and I, yeah. um, you know, we're in that talks, we're actually drafting a um, layout plan for a cultural practice school oh, for kids because we're cultural practitioners. And um, three of my children went through immersion. Um, one left in his senior year by choice and my other one, he puka just two years ago. So 
the value of that is imperative. But to teach um, place-based learning in their own ahupua'a yeah. is important because as much as they're in that location, right? right they're commuting, like you said. Yeah. We have to be able to have more of these opportunities to ground within our own ahupua'a, the keiki from that ahupua'a, so they have that imperative uh, connection that never goes away, right? We got emerging kids that are leaving, they go, personally I know, they graduated, went to college, and now they're teaching at Kamehameha. And I'm just like, okay, that's a great place. Right, right, right. No offense, but we, they have, to me, emerging kids have the most um, grounding in more than any other institutional academic institution that can provide the sustenance we need of our people it's those kids and I'm so proud of them like I as a mom who was cheering in football and supporting that I was like bro you guys don't even know how much you're inspiring us and those who are looking from the outside but it cannot just be one kula or two kula, right? Kaneohe get one over here, Waiao. My keiki went to Waiao, went to Nanakuni, then to um, Anue Nue, and that cannot be the only places. And if it is mandated, we need to have more for our keiki. And any keiki who choose to facilitate that. Like there because, shouldn't be a wait list. Yeah, yeah, there shouldn't be a wait list. And if there is a wait list, then how can we kakoho the, the, the parents, the kumu, the kula, to say we need more. If there's funding that's codified into law that 20% of the general fund goes to facilitate for our needs, then how come we only get so many, right? That is pinnacle to our existence. There's these grassroots efforts, what you're doing, but is it enough? It ushers in steps, but I don't think it's enough to shift the collective. It's gonna take us eons if we're still it's the pebble. in. It's the yeah, pebble. we're gonna put this pebble and then the add pebble. another one. We want boulders rolling into the change and effect to shift the collective because this is our pai aina, and the the understanding of the entirety that's flowing here should be from that, persp that cultural perspective because anything else separates us from life, separates us from everything that gives us life, and we're the people who facilitate that. We through our DNA, our koko brings forth that and other people can facilitate it but it's it's so impactful because we are of it yeah and the connection is is imperative for the existence of our people i keep saying that so sorry <laughs> no it's true though it's speaking. Yeah. so thank you for all that you do because yeah. if you need to share people to come talk all your work who wants to come bring their keiki i am a homeschool kumo i've left the doe um so i work with our nine keiki and then i help other parents who are trying to do culture place-based homeschool learning right but i would love to have a place but since you're facilitating some work is there information you'd like yeah. to share for people to talk about you yeah. any keikis that can come what is the age range because it's it's important the work that you do especially in your location right yeah. we're from white and i my ohana is from here and um well like two generations ago they're, they they used, used to live in here my grandfather was a conductor of the the train that oh, wow. my portuguese side yeah, yeah, and my yeah. hawaiian grandma was living here her first husband passed he was kanu here um and then um she saw a conductor and made his new family and that became my grandpa right but um so we have connections here we still have a lot of brown and a lot of green in your location it's a lot of gray and so what can you share with the people who can kaka o you? What age? Um, how can they just support you in that venture? Because what you're doing is so important for our people. Mahalo. Um, yeah, so we have a, a community workday every third Saturday at 9 o'clock. Um, more information, we're on Instagram. It's at hoolaho.ya.kalawao or um, hoolaho uh, hoolahoyakalawao.wordpress.com is the is the website so all the information is on there or Helen Helen yeah, knows I'll how to it, get in I'll put contact it share yeah. Lives, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah the, I think generally we have a, a community workday and then of course for folks who are having you need to um, to really like come often and whatnot um, then we can always talk stories about yeah about that I think with our site as opposed to like other places because we're dealing with I think certain challenges in an urbanized space and we're not allowed to have somebody live there um, it just becomes a little bit more complicated in terms of just having the, the, the place be open so it's a lot more coordinating and just being maka'ala to 
I mean, unfortunately, the things that are happening in a lot of our communities, yeah, tied to this disconnect between Kanaka and Aina, we see the symptoms mm -hmm. um, and the fruit of that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in our spaces. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, a lot of times it's just through conversation, and then, and then, um, as as we build Pinina, then then um, being able to. Open up so I'm going to ask you the hard question. Yeah. How do you feel the wave pool will impact? Our Eva Moku, you're very much grounded, rooted. Yeah. You're Ohana to hold back this emotion coming up. But um, uh, how do you feel through your Na'al, through your Kupuna, bring that forward to our people yeah. with your expertise? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to put these back. <laughs> how do you feel as a person of our community, as an educator, as a person who is restoring what is important? How will this wave pool affect our moku and the next generation as well. And that's what it's all about. So I think that'll be our last question because we're like at the end of time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I think there's different layers. So I think like on the physical layer, right? Like there's all of the gallons of water. There's the physical footprint um, that will happen. Um, the drilling, like all of the physical trauma um, and the physical extraction that will happen. Um, that I know you folks have done a, a, a really um, critical job and the critical work of communicating, right? Um, the, 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 the imprint and the layout on secret sites, on burial sites, on, you know, I was pulling up this old um, survey from this area and it was saying, you know, like some of the, the earliest um, burial and some of the earliest uh, dwellings in this community were right here yes. we're right in this area um, and all of the quote-unquote sinkholes were the burial sites for Ibi Kukuna and whatnot and so I think there's a physical disruption and trauma um, of that um, and then layered on top of that right or perhaps beneath it is the spiritual trauma that that is happening on top of that right where um, they're Evie is not just Evie, right? Like Evie is, there's there's the spiritual component as it ties to today. And so if we're talking about the trauma in, in our community in Waimalu or in, in Kalawao and on that side, part of it is the, our people are living out without even knowing it, the spiritual trauma of physical things that yeah. have happened yeah. centuries yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, and our Aina, our Aina remembers, yeah. and our bodies remember, even right. though we physically were not around at those I times, that our bodies remember and they hold those yes. those Traumas, pieces. Yeah. And so I think that's where like the physical and the spiritual kind of intersect. And then there's the cultural layer, right? Like so, I yeah. I was sharing how in my lifetime, I never saw all of these things as quote unquote like places of of abundance and food because they were already contaminated by the time I was born. Porridge Center was already created by the time I was born and so in a cultural sense our generation was taught to connect with buildings and so there's the cultural thing shifts that that can happen where it's okay you know like it's it's teaching future generations oh it's normal to have a wave pool less than a mile away from the ocean that's gonna be taking fresh water polluting it and then flushing it into the ocean in an area that is supposed to be for food. Right. And it's normalizing a completely ridiculous and, and oppressive practice. And I think that's something that gets happened that happens again and again and again. Oh yeah, of course, let's build this canal to be able to dry out all of the loi at Waikiki. And it's normal to see buildings on top of a wetland that is made for loi palo. Yeah, let's build this canal right next to Kaonohi to drain all of the, the, the springs so that we can build this shopping center and call it Pearl Ridge Center and make that the heart of the Aiea community. And that becomes normal and that's the narrative that gets retold. And so there's the, there's the threat of, of the cultural piece as well. Um, and so it's like all of those things combined. And so for, for you folks, to stand here, it's like you're standing at the intersection of all of those things. Now you're you're physically here to PIE these these places. You're shifting the cultural narrative to to remind us like, hey, this this is actually completely dysfunctional. The way that we are planning things is completely dysfunctional. We have just we have just taught ourselves 
that it's normal to have concrete. We've taught ourselves that it's normal to have these freaking wave pools that, that are completely unnecessary um, and that that Aina is just a thing to build on um, versus something that can actually sustain and give life to our people and that our people also need to connect with. Um, and I have one, uh, sorry, one more, I get one more oh, kupuna, yes, one more kupuna thing. Um, so Uncle Henry Chang Wo, um, oh, you know, like give his life, um, yes. give his life to fight against development in this community. It was a kupa of Eva. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him, but I've heard a lot about him and just the work that he's done through um, the Mahi Ai at, at Kaonohi, Anthony Deleuze, because they were very close um, and were a part of fighting a lot of the development, unfortunately, of communities that we see today on this side. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that he shared was, you know, you know you're going to have a healthy kai and healthy limu but in order to do that, you have to watch that first drop of water up Mocha, and then you need to follow it all the way down to the Kai. Yeah, and so to what you were you were talking about earlier, Helani, right? There's a there's a kuleana. There's a there the the level of kuleana shifts if we really see Aina as Aina. If we really see Aina as alive and thriving, but also connected with all of the different components. And I think you know to your question about this this wave pool. Um, that's land, yeah. That's the definition of, of, of Aina as, as just land. It's just something to, to develop for the pleasure of people. Um, as opposed to really seeing our health and our, our, our livelihood and, and our, um, our generational connection to Aina, right? Like the, the Aina here that we're on remembers thousands yeah. of years ago. Yeah. Um, and the kupuna, you know, that continue to reside in these spaces. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's those those layered, the, the, the potential of layered trauma that will have ripple effects for generations if they choose to just ignore. Thank you. Thank you. So your final answer, wave pool, no wave pool. Mahalo <laughs> Thank for your you. input. Mahalo. Thank you so much, um, Danny, and uh, mahalo for coming and just sharing space with us yeah. and uh, supporting supporting us here as we try to ho'oponopono this aina and what's going on here. Um, and I want to mahalo everybody for your support and come out and I'll put the website for Danny's um, for uh, the area in Pu'uloa where Danny helps to malama um, and if you're interested in going there to malama um, just go and click on the web web website thank you awesome aloha. 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 thank you aloha aloha everyone um Sialani sonora pale uh, here with nakia io vaiha and we are still holding space it's day two it's day two of our occupation here at kalailoa in front of the proposed site of the wave pool the wave village uh, that is going to be using, they're proposing to use 7 million gallons of fresh water for a five acre pool, wave pool, and on a site that has Ivi Kupuna, on a site that has uh, the karst sinkhole system that um, feeds our limu, and um, on a site that is the habitat for many, many endangered species. So I want to um, have everybody introduce themselves from Nakia uh, Iowaiha, starting with um, Tita Tara. <coughs> Aloha, I'm Tara and I live here in Eva Beach, Honu Olu Uli. Aloha mai kako, oa oka iolani. Uh, my ohana is from this area, Kalailoa, Pu'uloa and um, Waianai. And my relation to this area comes through that descendancy. So very thankful to be here to bring all this information to you guys. Mahalo. Okay. And then our, um, I was just going to introduce the, the kia'i first. Sorry, come on, come on. Here you go. Aloha kako, oa hine ka iulani, um, noho mayao owa anai. <laughs> but I'm here for the love of Eva. <laughs> Hi, I'm JP. Kale, um, Akana brought me and I'm here to stay. Hello, um, and so um, this is our second speaker today. 
Um, we're going to have a discussion today with um, Kahu Kaleo Patterson. And uh, our first speaker was Daniel Esperito. She talked about the Lo'ikalo and about her work at Pu'uloa. Uh, we're here with Kahu Kaleo Patterson. He is the chaplain for St. Ep Stephen's Episcopal Church and also heads up a uh, Peace and Reconciliation Committee for the Episcopalian um, Diocese here. So um, if you can just share a little bit about yourself, Kahu Kaleo, and um, your connection to this vahi, but like your name, where you're from, and just your connection here. <clears throat> hello. hello, hello everybody. My name is Kaleo Patterson. I'm from Makaha, and uh, it's, it's good to be here. I have uh, Ohana from the the ancients and the ancestors uh, of this place, uh, history, and uh, years ago, I'm, I can't even remember the, the dates, but, uh, you know, I was involved with the groups that had organized around the Oneula uh, Ocean Point project and the uh, proposed harbor, which is, which is now a, uh, some kind of a recreational pool, and uh, so I have some history with that, and uh, and uh, this area, and I, I, I'm just remembering today, uh, you know, this area has been ignored for many, many years um, in regards to its cultural significance. It kind of looks like a, uh, a place with uh, just uplifted coral. But uh, actually, I remember a meeting uh, that we had many years ago at Komakapili Church, Pua Kanahele from uh, uh, Moko Keave was with us and we were talking about some of the issues and she said, you know, the up places where there's uplifted coral, like Oneula, are very sacred places, yeah, that remind us about the, the origins and the beginnings of our existence on this earth. So if you go to the Kumulipo, she said, you know, all of life comes out of the ocean and the coral polyp is the uh, uh, first life form. And so that Eva Plain, she said, uh, a, a district of the chiefs. Onehula is the Red Sands, yeah. Very sacred place. And uh, <clears throat> Mary Kavena Pukui uh, writes about the sacredness of this place, too, yeah. And so it's good to be here to talk story, yeah, and uh, say a few words, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kaho. Um, yeah, so we are interested in hearing about your work uh, protecting Onehula. Mm -hmm which is currently the site of Waikai Surf uh, Wave Pool. And um, and if any of you don't know, Oneula is actually referring to the red sands because it was the birthing um, sands of Ali'i. And so, um, and then that's one of the metaphors, but also Uncle Wally Ito had shared that one of the other meanings of Oneula, which, is, which means red sand, One meaning sand, Ula meaning red, is the the red um, uh, seaweed limo yes, yes. in the ocean, and if you look, you know, one of our favorite limos is limo kohu, and that area was very well known for limo kohu. And if you look at limo kohu in the in the kai, it looks red. So, but if you can just share a little bit about your work and and the um, some of the sites that you saw. Yes. Yes. And the. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so just kind of just give kind of lay the the, yeah. the background of of what happened okay. Yeah uh, So y years ago, I, I was on Kauai for many years involved in many things on Kauai and then came back to Oahu in the uh, mid mid 90s and around that time uh, the development of uh, Oneula and Ocean Point was uh, just beginning and Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, people in the community were concerned about that uh, uh, development which and the the building of a, a draft a big harbor that would be part of that development there uh, and la later we finally uh, came to the conclusion that 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 digging was necessary in order to uh, create fill material to lift the elevation of the uh, subdivision that was in the uh, uh, homes that were going to be built uh, up Malka from the ocean yeah and, and so they need, you know, the developers needed the, uh, the coral and needed to dig that from, and so they saved a lot of money. In the process, uh, we, community uh, analysis, uh, uh, you know, determined that they were going to crack the cap rock, yeah? Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and that they did. The uh, water was leaking out. You know, my uh, recollections of the details are not, are not, are still are kind of fuzzy today. Because it seems like many years ago. <clears throat> but one of the other issues before they were digging, they were getting uh, ready to dig out that uh, section. And we were, my organization, uh, uh, Pacific Justice and Reconciliation Center, um, we're, we're asked to help uh, families and cultural practitioners uh, because there was evidence of, of uh, fishing shrines in the bushes yeah, of Onihula, yeah? right in the area where the... Um, is, is that how bush? What yeah, how, yeah right in front of right, right Mauka in the Kiave, uh, there were uh, fishing shrines, uh, tall coral structures, yeah? That if you walk through the, so we went to go see, yeah? And uh, we had a photographer from Kamehameha Schools, uh, Jan uh, Beckett, and uh, he had already walked through that area with, uh, uh, gosh, I can't remember names, but there were some very prominent people from Kamehameha that were aware of these fish, fishing shrines, about 30 fishing shrines uh, that were like statues, yeah? And they were located, if you walk through, you could see them. And they, they looked so unusual, they, as if somebody stood them up, yeah? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you'd be walking through the Kiabi and then you'd see this, okay? And so they began to take photographs, and there's a book. You got to go find the book by Jan Beckett of the fishing shrines of Onehula, yeah? And if you look at the fishing shrines, uh, you know, once that, those photographs uh, started getting getting around, people were seeing faces, and I mean, they you know, all kind of all kinds of spiritual things that were coming out of that uh, assessment, and uh, so those fishing shrines, and uh, also at the time, uh, uh, we were able to to get uh, maybe 20 Hawaiian churches to learn about the issue, and I, I remember this day at, at, at Kauai Hall Church, we had 20 uh, meeting of uh, many of the Hawaiian churches. And, and the Hawaiian churches uh, signed on. Almost, I think all the Hawaiian churches that were there signed on to a uh, petition to stop the project and to reassess the uh, cultural assessment that had been made. Yeah? And, and, and Army Corps of Engineers, I think we went and uh, uh, delivered uh, that petition uh, to the offices of the uh, Army Corps of Engineers at Fort Shafter. And, and, and they were kind, they received uh, the petition, and then they stopped the project for a whole year and called for a reassessment of the uh, cultural inventory and so on and so forth. And so that was significant, yeah, that the community was involved and that the Army Corps of Engineers was willing to, to look at things that were, that were being documented and things that were raising questions about the cultural uh, and historical assessment and um, survey of the area. Also, we, we noticed uh, in the archaeology that the history of the area was not really being depicted in a, in a, in a very strong way, yeah? and it was being diminished, you know, the significance of the area. And so we had to bring forth a lot of that material as well, the historical uh, uh, historicity of the, of the area and, uh, you know, some of the stories that were related to, I, I can just remember a few, uh, Mary Cavena Pukui writes about walking walking through this place and he makes comments wow. about the uh, writings uh, about the uh, historic significance. So I'm sure we have a, a new uh, um, reason to revisit the history of this area. If you, and now, but now there's been more technology, more writings have been interpreted. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more history that has yet to be uncovered and um, and told about this area. So I, I want to just encourage uh, people who have knowledge of this area to uh, assist in uh, the, 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 you know, understanding again what what this place uh, is about, the significance. Uh, and I'm glad there's a group that's uh, actively uh, pursuing uh, the, the increase of knowledge and the educating, education, advocacy of, uh, of uh, these uh, places. So this is... Uh, we found uh, in, in our research and uh, in just walking the land that in, indeed this area is, is a very sacred, sacred place, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
when we were able to get a, a delay of the construction, we walked through again with uh, cultural practitioners and um, yeah, so it's important to bring cultural practitioners, not just archaeologists, right? Mm -hmm. And to bring families that may have, we, we discovered uh, families, fishermen, coastal fishermen, that were aware of the fishing shrines and uh, ha had been making offerings to the fishing shrines, okay? So that's cultural use, yeah? Yes. And nobody, nobody yes. knew about that, but we had guys that uh, stepped forward and said, oh, my ohana, we would always uh, make whole kupu, yeah? Because we fish, we fish, dive, um, you know, the, the core, core through lay net, yeah? The uplifted coral, the, the karst, uh, the sinkholes, we, we discovered and had, we all had to learn about these things. Had, still had opai ula, yeah, inside, yeah? You know the opai ula, yeah? Opai ula goes out into the ocean, and uh, you have the akuli and the opelo, and uh, so it's, it's an ecosystem, yeah? This kind of area has its own ecosystem, which has uh, developed uh, over the years, and the Hawaiians uh, uh, were in syn syncret syncreticity, is that a word? Yes. We're in synchronicity, yes. synchronicity yes. with with this land, yeah. Yes. And 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 some some Hawaiians in this area still cherish the limu, uh, the limu uh, where you used to have plenty of ogo over here, yeah. In the old days, limu kala, limu uh, uh, ka, uh, limu koho, yeah. And so this is a this is an endangered resource here on this coastal. Uh, area yeah. now now eventually uh, what what the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and uh, the, the current uh, legal system of the state of Hawaii um, <clears throat> and we won't say too much about the state of Hawaii but mm -hmm. the laws and the policies are have, we're not good policies we know they're a lot of laws need to be needed to be changed, especially in burials. Mm -hmm. When Honokuhua was going off and burials were being uh, put in the trash cans on Maui, uh, new burial laws had to come about. And during the Wahe administration, a lot of burial laws were changed. Cultural uh, laws were, were changed. And Hawaiian rights, uh, the Pash decision, Hawaiians have rights to go mauka and gather and do all of those kind of laws came out of advocacy and uh, activism but we know that the laws that are in Hawaii to protect places like this can be stronger yeah yes. and and so sometimes when you have laws that are more uh, beneficial to developers and outside uh, interests um, you know, pull hole, yeah, because Hawaiians have to come forward then, yeah, and and have to uh, develop strategies to, uh, you know, delay or, or stop projects that are uh, deemed to be impactful, mm -hmm. and uh, and eventually the law, hopefully laws will be changed, yeah, mm -hmm. and so it's a lot of issues. Um, you know, favor uh, development, yeah. A lot of uh, remaining uh, lands in Hawaii uh, are uh, <clears throat> up for grabs uh, when it comes to uh, economic development things. So anyway, uh, you know, that's just a little bit, but, uh, you know, maybe I should stop there because I'm uh, yeah. talking story too much already. Well, oh, thank you. That was awesome. Do you have any questions? Yes. So, uh, mahalo for that beautiful ike that you have brought forward for all of our the world to learn from. It's not just um, our moku specifically, not just our mokupuni, but whenever we have that wealth of knowledge that comes forward, we're actually bringing forward your kupuna and the kupuna in which you're channeling from the work that you have done, the hana. And um, I would personally like to ask you, in your work, in, in that specific hana and that ala that you took to kako'o eva, um, did you see a change within the community in that immediate action? I guess we, you know, what we're doing here, we want to know that there is a trickle or a pebble in the pond effect where we stand because maybe people aren't aware. Um, 
people need that ike. So when you brought forward that change that was needed for that community or that awareness, how did that work based on what you saw in the lens of your work as a kahu or any one-on-ones? How was people's response to your action? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. So one of the big issues, as I mentioned, was the 30, the 30 or so fishing shrines. And so we worked hard to get those documented because we had a sense that those were going to go down, yeah? And uh, so, but so you do what you can, yeah? To, Akau, did they go yeah. down, the 30? Yes, yes, they went, they went they down. They took them all down. They, they took them all down. And so what happened was after a year of, uh, and so you use that time, yeah, to do more history, mm-hmm. uh, to bring more cultural practitioners to the area so they can learn, yeah, they can... And, and you want to document that history because, yes, it might happen. It might Everything's going to go down. But at least you're going to have that history. People will have some relationship with the aina, yeah? So you use it to bring people to the aina. And uh, if anything, just the aloha aina, yeah? The aina, yeah? Now, those 30 sites, after one year, uh, Board of, uh, not Board of, you know, not Board of Water Supply, but the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, after, in reviewing in that, that political process, said, uh, I think the archaeologists and historic scientists said, well, you know, those shrines, and this is what they'll always say, and uh, those, those shrines and uh, a lot of those uh, sea structures that are in the area, which is, you probably have a lot of stuff here. I bet you there's shrines here too, you know? He said, uh, oh, we, you know, those are not important. Those are, are look significant, but they're not important because we have examples of those on all the islands. And that's the... <laughs> That's the, it's a confession. Yeah, that's, that's you know. <laughs> so they said, we can take those out. They said, you can take oh, those out. Yeah. Right? So see see what I'm saying? They're, they're referring to a law that allows them to do that, mm. right? You, so you have to change the law, yeah. right? And so, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody worked on that, but that's the kind of thing that has to happen, yeah? Yeah, we, you know, so same thing with burials. The laws were changed. You know, we worked on uh, a lot of good, good laws. Those laws get reviewed every year by uh, N- NAGPRA, right? They, they'll come to Hawaii, they'll go visit Indian country, and they'll review the laws and they'll make changes every year, yeah? Wow. So same with the archaeological stuff. I think there's more work to be done in that area. This is a good uh, a project to revisit the laws that are allowing this and that. Just to, just to work it, educate people. Now those shrines went down. Those shrines went down, and of course, uh, you know everybody unhappy. And uh, but by that time, there's a there's a good community. Yeah, yes. people have been politicized, and and so when the when the shrines went down, you know we did things like uh, build an ahu yeah to uh, aloha the shrines that were going down, and uh, to have some uh, ritual yeah and ceremony. So we built ahu and. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> when those uh, shrines went down, right before the shrines went down, the, uh, the process did identify one site that, that needed to be saved, yeah? Mm. So you don't know how many sites you're going to save, but even if it's one, it's worth it, yeah? Mm. But this one site that was saved was, was a little site about like this, yeah? So we all walked through with the archaeologists and checking out all the sites. He said, well, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. This one site was in the middle of the, har- the proposed harbor, right? In the front. So it was like right where the entrance to the harbor was supposed to be. And, and so that one site was determined to be something worthy to be saved. And, the, and even the archaeologists said that, right? Yeah, we, and, but, you know, we, we can, yeah. So they had to carve. So when they said that they were going to start up again, yeah, that one site that was saved. They had to create a peninsula at the entrance to save that one site. Now I don't know if it's if, if it's still there, but that's something you should follow up on. Is that Homer? Is that yeah. the Pauhaku, <laughs> Homer? Where the Pauhaku cave it's covering right there? They have. Some well, it was right a, it was an upright stone. Uh, cool, yeah, and then and then you can it's see. It's right at the beginning yeah. of Onegula. Yeah, it's right. No, it's right in the where the entrance to the, the entrance harbor. Oh. But that's where you guys got to do okay. research. Yeah. Right, right. Now, like now, now so they had caved in and they decided to re-de- redesign oh. the harbor so the entrance was compromised. Yeah because of that one site. Wow. Okay, so you want to find your one site in here, yeah? Wow. Okay? And do education mm-hmm. and uh, do protocol because yeah. that's, uh, you know, that's due diligence for our ancestors yeah. and our sure. ancients that we, yeah. you know, 
And then, so, you know, the, they, they, they went ahead and dug. We, we came in and uh, did uh, protocols and, and what have you. And um, a book came out of that. We, we had learned a lot more about the history of the area. And uh, we always made the claim that, you know, there's lots of, must be lots of burials in this uh, area where you're going to dig. And they kept insisting that there were no burials anywhere, yeah? No, no burials. Way. And that's, uh, you know, it was hard to believe. Yes, and, uh, but anyway, a few years later, uh, we get a call from uh, Kai Markel, and he said, hey, we found the burial came up, yeah? People who were living on the beach uh, found the burial, and I think it was like Malka of the entrance to the harbor, and uh, and it was an Ali'i burial with a woman with Ni Niho Palawa, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you guys, you guys, you guys got to look that up. She had one in each week. Yeah, she had one. In, so you, you're familiar with that? Yeah. Yes, the yeah. Of the hair. yeah. yeah. Oh, so a lot of history, a lot of history came up, started to come up about who that was. And that's what, and that'll help you understand more about what Eva, this area, was about. Who was that Ali? Why was she buried here? And that, that's uh, you know, additional uh, evidence and uh, mm -hmm. testimony of the importance of this area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, was she an isolated burial, or are there other burials, or were there? Was this a special place to, uh, to, to bury Ali? Yeah. And uh, so there's a lot of research that came up. When they went and started the digging, they busted the cap rock. Mm -hmm. And so there's water flowing out. So you want to find out what's, what's happened with that. Yeah. And you want to monitor that, yeah? So sometimes, uh, you know, we get involved in an issue and, uh, oh, we get beat up. We get uh, worn out and, uh, you know, we got a whole maha for a while. Uh, but we got to get, we got to stay with it. You know, we got to watch and monitor, yeah? But so this whole area, you know, is really one area, yeah. But we've di divided it up, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have different families that jump in and uh, different now with different generations too, yeah. So this is a this is a big a big project. Uh, you know, we know there's going to be a lot more development, yeah. And um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of homework, yeah, a lot of homework and research and. I'm glad you're bringing people to the site so that they can uh, become uh, more familiar and develop a relationship with this place. And a lot of pulia is is good. And um, you know, so now now we have uh, you know people that are a part of this project that we, some of us are related to. Yeah. So even more now, we we have to be very uh, uh, you know ha ha and uh, find ways to really do good education. Yeah. And I know there's some good, good uh, material uh, research that's out there now. We've had uh, several years, maybe 10, 15 years since uh, Onehula, where, uh, where, uh, when uh, you know a lot of uh, translations of uh, documents and uh, newspaper reports in the old days are coming out. Yeah, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. A lot more material, and so, you know, I, I just think that. Uh, Did you know Uncle Henry Chang Wu? Yeah, I th is that the limo, limo guy? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Back in those so, days. I have a question. Yeah. Mahalo for that response. Um, as an expert in your uh, gift from God, chosen and ordained, um, do you believe it's acceptable morally um, to remove graves for commercial pros profit? I don't know why I'm reading it because I know it, but wanted it to be pono to what we're asking. But in your expertise, are there alternatives if you agree or don't agree what are the alternatives for commercial given the context of our occupation here right um it seems that the space in the direction of our state there's a lot of commercial development and we know our people put our kupuna in the aina in which they live therefore as commercial development continues to occur as a declared and defined means of profit that is necessary for the economy. As a kahu, is there an alternative for EVs? Is it okay? Is it morally right in the consecration of your work? Is there an alternative for this? Or 
how do you, you know, it's the people say it's a balance between sustainability for the economy to be then provide for the people. We have to create commercial contracts. We need to create commercial development. If we don't, there's no money to take care of us. So with that understanding, based on the construct that's occurring here in the Paya'ina, if they're saying development is going to occur regardless, what is the context of your spiritual aspect and input when we take out EV out of the ground? Yeah, so, so again, we go back to the laws. Yeah. So the laws, there's a lot of guidance on what to do with uh, uh, EV kupuna when you have uh, inadvertent discoveries or uh, when, when you know that there are burials there and uh, is it okay to... Uh, come up with a project where those burials are going to be removed. Yeah, so there are a lot of laws, and one of the important aspects of the laws is that the government doesn't decide that, but the, the descendants, the cultural and lineal descendants, uh, make all decisions related to uh, kupuna that are determined to be historic in nature. Yeah, and even that, there's a definition uh, for that, and I wish I could uh, have memorized that. But whenever there's a discovery of uh, historic uh, human remains in Hawaii, and there, there's some pretty good guidelines for that, which has been created by Hawaiians, but, you know, those uh, guidelines and laws have to be revisited every year, yeah? Uncle. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, yeah. But, but anyway, so let me give you some examples, yeah? Uh, burials uh, many times will be relocated, yeah, if they're found, yeah. And uh, many, many times fa the families and lineal and cultural descendants will, will agree, for that, agree to that, yeah, because they can't imagine a, of a family of, uh, of Hawaiians uh, that are discovered under the concrete slab in the Coco Palms Hotel, le leaving in the kitchen leaving them under the kitchen in the so they'll relocate them so when i first uh started, was a kahu beginning on Kauai, uh there was a family under in the kitchen uh and i so they wanted me to come and pull it so i pull it and the protocol was young young hawaii in those days no laws in those days so they decided they, they didn't want they were going to move that family into the garden behind the uh, cocoa palms and uh and kanu, you know, the EV uh, in the garden and make uh, pohaku on top. And, you know, so that's been done in Waikiki as well. You have many uh, uh, EV kupuna. When Waikiki uh, was born, a lot of history of burials being found when they built hotels or roadways. And so they, many hotels have uh, relocated burials uh, onto the, on the property somewhere. And those are supposed to be documented now. And so now, but now if a burial is found in the Sheridan um, um, Kayulani Hotel, burial council, uh, you know, is triggered and lineal descendants are, uh, there's a, an announcement made in the newspapers and every people come in and uh, have to decide what to do with those burials. I, I was uh, called, uh, I, I get called every, every every so often to help uh, stop a project when EV are born because contractors in the old days, even though there were laws, they would not would not stop, yeah? It's very costly. Walmart Keomoku was uh, one, one case, 60 burials were discovered. They were left in the trench and it was raining and and so we, you know, we had to, uh, you know, I was called and so I, uh, you know, uh, called uh, some of the, um, the, the officials involved and and brought in some of the Hawaiians and uh, and, and so so a lot of times it happens like that yeah and because uh, the trenches were filling up with water the bones were in the trenches uh, the um, it was just, just decided that they should be taken out and uh, placed uh, in a in a trailer yeah but there were still a lot of problems with having the barrels in the trailer uh, you know the rail project has a standing. Uh, policy now that all burials found uh, in the guideway, on the guideway, uh, the roadway would be left in the roadway, yeah. And, but others, other Hawaiians uh, really wanted to relocate uh, EV that were born and create a, royal, a mausoleum somewhere in Kaka'ako, yeah. So, there, so those are the uh, ways in which uh, 
uh, you know, Hawaiians are trying to address uh, uh, burials, iwi kupuna, yeah. And uh, so, what, and uh, here's another example. On Kalakaua, one year, they were uh, replacing all the water lines uh, in, the, in the roadway. And they kept finding burials as when they were going alongside of the uh, water lines, old water lines. So in the walls of the trenches that they were digging, there were burials, right? And uh, it got to be about 50. 50 burials were found. And so finally, again, yeah, we stopped the, we, you know, we, have, we stopped the project. So Hawaiians have to really uh, uh, come to the forefront and uh, ask the government that this is not right. Stop the project. And those burials, so they had to stop the project. There was a 24-hour prayer vigil on the beach at Waikiki with the mayor and uh, the Board of Water Supply. And those are the kind of processes that, you know, community has, has needs to uh, envision and not be shy about uh, getting involved and holding uh, uh, agencies and people accountable, yeah, government accountable for, for the things that are not right. Yeah? Those burials, uh, families came in and those uh, decided that we're going to move all those burials. And those burials uh, are, were buried uh, at the corner of Kalakaua in uh, uh, Kapahulu, uh, right in front of the zoo. There's a, there's a, ma- there's a mausoleum there. And uh, so, so the families decided to build that. And then they brought back a lot of burials that were, yeah, they brought back a lot of burials that were being stored at Bishop Museum. And there's still a lot of burials stored in Bishop Museum that had been had been removed from the old days, yeah. But anyway, that's a long answer to uh, Oh, thank you. But, you know, and, and I think uh, for all of, for Kia'i, Evie, like myself, you know, so every I think every Kia'i, Evie is different, but for us, we're about preserving place. Mm-hmm. And for us, that's the most pono. Um, because any kind of uncovering of the EV is desecration. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, so, you know, since uh, Israel and Gaza is in the news and we're all calling yeah. for a ceasefire yeah. and humanitarian aid in Gaza, in Israel, many years ago, we learned that whenever they, because that's an old place, but they're always finding burials uh, on the in the roads, and they have a protocol. As soon as they find that burial, boom, they put it down deeper, and they protect it, and they cover the road, and boom, the Hot traffic, traffic's running again. Yeah, and I know that Israelis are, um, the Zionists are digging up the Palestinian graves. Oh, oh no! And that's a way of erasure. Right. So you know, t- removing graves, especially from the place where they were originally right. put, is a way of them to erase us from the land. So um, that is always a hotly contested issue, but I think. For a lot of us today, we we're done. Like we just want it to. We want them to stay where they are. And um, but thank you, Kahu, for for your manao on that. And you know, you know, for the I guess um, closing, you know, manao would be because your lunch just arrived. So <laughs> we're like, uh, yeah, you can bless our our food, and then we go um go everybody go eat, and then. Oh yeah, um, oh yeah. We'll make the wave for the last question. But um, so I guess we maybe two questions, right? So one, yeah. my question is, like, what would you suggest for us to do moving forward regarding this project that's being proposed here, where there are at least one EV mound here, but there's that's probably known. more. That's known. One yeah, known, but there may be more because we know we're right next to right a very ancient village system, possibly one of the first that um, is on Oahu that they came here from Tahiti. So, the one of our last questions to our um, interviewees is, what are your thoughts on this wave pool from the context of your expertise and the impact to this specific moku? Should it? Holomua, should it continue forward? Yeah. So two questions. Yeah. yeah. Like, what is um, what you, what's your advice to us? And then, like, what is your manao on this wave pool project? Yeah. 
What was the first question again? <laughs> advice. Oh, on what? Yeah. On, on, on what you think. Oh, okay. Some advice on what you think we should yeah, do. Yeah, I, I think I think always we have to do do uh, good good work research and uh, we got we got to match the uh, you know the the systems that are coming mm -hmm. at us from foreign interests and development uh, interests and uh, you know people are always uh, trying trying to. Um, do things and uh, but you know Kanaka, the Kanaka got to take the lead yeah in uh, determining uh, land use and uh, yeah. and cultural uh, facts and uh, so you know the the way the wave pool I, I you know I'm not sure I, I you know I think uh, you know part part of this is about tourism part part about this is about foreign interests but we have we have Hawaiians involved in this and I want to respect uh, the Hawaiians that are involved in this and encourage uh, everybody to. To do good, you know, to do good uh, research on what's really being done here. Yeah, the impact of the land, I, I think, is a concern. I know, I know that uh, uh, the developers and uh, people involved in that are, are doing the best they can to um, understand uh, the impacts and to mitigate uh, the impacts. And uh, on on the side of the community, you want to look to see if the laws are adequate. Yeah. Uh, because they may not be as strong as they should be, and so that's a disadvantage. And so you have to find a ways to address that. The um, the laws that may not be as, as strong as they should, uh, because uh, you know in the end this this goes it gets reviewed in the political process. Yeah, so you have to match that uh, match that uh, in intellectual uh, you know approach and. Uh, you come up with better science and, 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 and better results. And you just have to really uh, uh, s s step it up. And, uh, and that's going to be good for, for generations down the road, you know, whatever you discover. And, um, but the, the wave pool is, is, is tough. Yeah? You've got, you got a lot of people that surf and uh, you know, a lot of people that uh, <laughs> want to, uh, you know, yeah, so, okay, but anyway, here you go. Aloha. You? Thank you for coming. Mm. Mm. Yeah, hey Thank guys, you. how's it going? Turn around, get your picture taken right there. We on video. Oh, Rob, I'm so <laughs> yeah. sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. Hey no, it's all informal. Oh. It's all informal. Mahalo. Oh. Have a resident here, support of, of what we're doing here. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you so much for that yeah. one out. And I know you're in a hard place because the, you know, yeah, the see. Keolanas are right down sure, the road sure, from where sure. you live. <laughs> no, no. So, yeah, so actually, I just want to say, uh, you know, Brian Keolana, I know, is uh, associated with this project. Well, Brian's a good friend. He He's my next door neighbor. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Wow. So I know Brian a long time. He grew up, My I'm older than Brian, but my brothers are really close to him and and have been involved with uh, Brian and the jet ski developments and Brian has risked his life for many people on the Waianae coast in the ocean, and he's a good he's a good uh, guy. And uh, you know, I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray for you folks too, that uh, we come to some good understanding about what needs to happen here. Uh, but um, you know, the environmental I think the environmental uh, impact here might might be really really um, important to look at. And, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I think there's going to be impact. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the development of this area, uh, you know, the wave pool may not be the most culturally appropriate way to develop this area. And, uh, but we need, we need to work together and, uh, and, and try to resolve uh, whatever the issues are. And um, I'm going to be praying for everybody. Thank you, okay. Kahu. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing your mana'o and experience about your struggles, trying to protect uh, what was left of the standing um, coral um, coral shrines in Oneula. Um, and, you know, the struggle continues. Um, and we are blessed to have, you know, kupuna like you around still to help guide us and provide us good insight. you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I just want to mahalo you from your kupuna, from my kupuna to your kupuna and the space that you hold for our people um, to help to bring the middle ground but also to remember the sacred sanctity of EV because above all commercial profit in this litigation we believe that um, it's a no-go but you bring that space of 
maybe humility ha ha and just to open up on this process and to bring you know fair and just understandings right we, we just want to be just so mahalo so much for bringing your ike mahalo nui did you have any thoughts Yes. No, and just mahalo nui for sharing, you know, all the mo'olelo, all the ike of actually walking through this space, you know, and just, uh, again, just providing your ike some mahalo nui. Yes. Mahalo. Yeah. Yeah. all of us. Yeah. Yes. Wahine, you want to say something as an yeah. opio? Oh, mahalo. Opio, checking in. <laughs> um, actually, Uncle, I would love to know what is the name of the book again and what is the author? Because I think that is very vital to a lot of us who are out here doing Kia E work in the Eva area and for future generations. So can we get that yeah, on the record? Nice and clear. I don't know. It might be just uh, Jan Beckett. I think his name is Jan, Jan Beckett. Beckett. Okay. And uh, but uh, I'm gonna go look it photographer up. for Kamehameha schools back in those days. Okay. Yeah. Jan Beckett. Jan Beckett. Jan, yeah. Jan, Jan, I think it's I A N. Jan Beckett. Oh, Jan. Okay. And uh, who would who would know about that? Yeah. Fishing villages of Oneula. Yeah, fishing, fishing villages. Shrines. Yeah, I, yeah. I'll I'll do some. Re I'll see if I can okay. find that. And then, Thank you. Uh, but you know, I would I would check uh, in with the border. The um, I would check in with the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. Because I remember a couple of years ago, they, they called me in to say a little bit of, because they were trying to educate people on what happened, right? And But, yeah, go visit the Army Corps of Engineers. Ask them about that project. And if you can uh, get copies get, get copies yeah. of the material. Are they located in a specific place on island? Their office yeah. or? See, I don't know. I don't know. I think we'll have to just we'll follow. We'll follow engineers. up on that. Yeah. You need to you need to know where they. <laughs> okay. So they're the ones that are managing the the water resources. Right? Awesome. So we're gonna end this um, yep. live and um, pule for the meai and serve lunch now. Um, yep. Yeah. So we will be um, doing our PFAS test next. Um, so we will be filming that live as well here. Uh, so we'll be doing water tests uh, and uh, there's more to come. So stay tuned. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha. We're here at um, Coral Sea Road and we have some guests that would like to share with you all. We're still here holding space, holding it down. Nakia i Obaiha today. Um, if you haven't seen all of our posts today, please check out Kalahui. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, don't, I don't give you my key. Keep going. You can check out Kalahui Hawaii, Hawaii's page. Um, also, Nakia i Obaiha for updates. And we're going to start this afternoon. We're still here. I believe it's our third live of the day interviews um, to get the take on our community members. So here we have today. Introduce yourself. Okay, hello, Um The reason I came here, I came to Kako Cousin Dam for Nakia Iwo by Eha. I think uh, my connection is probably through the Land Commission Award. I'm not a direct heir, but they are. I'm a lateral descendant of Kekka Naomi. So that's why I'm here to call uh, Cousin Mahalo. Okay. Mahalo. 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 Tell us who you are and your connection to this Kahia. Okele Ko'u Inoa, Akana. And I was born and raised in Onelua, actually how Bush. And I live Thank you. in this area again now, and so family, 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 family brought us to this discussion, and so yeah, that's how we made it. We're happy to be here. Uh, aloha, everyone. Joe Kana here. Um, I'm actually here because I'm supporting and supporting the folks here, but I think it's a connection for all of us to have with regards to the water. If water is truly our life. <clears throat> And it is, then we should all be connected with that water, yeah? And that's why we're here. Oh, yeah. Hello, my kako. Ova o nani. O ka oya i o noe anai mayao. I a olevo he kupa no ke ia aina aka maoka ke kahea o ke kokua o ke kupa a ana e ia no vau. I no kamalama ana ika aina, no kamalama ana ika ivi, 
o ia aina no ka malama ana i ka vai o ia aina o ka aina holo ko a o ka ko no laila o ia no no ho vau ma wai ana i ki ia manawa o ke ia ko u aina ke kahi ai no laila kia i vau ke la me ke ia vahi pana no ka pono o ka ko no ka pono o ka ko ka ha vai i a me ka mea kana kana ka a ole paha hawaii no hoi a ka nui ke aloha no ke aloha o ke ia aina pono kako e malama a ke ai mau a mau ai thank you mahalo mahalo so heartfelt to hear people coming out for the kahea that has been placed upon everyone's hearts right now there's um a lot of sentiment a lot of sentiment regarding this development and we're so honored to have these um, special guests as we have throughout the day just to share a little bit um, what's on their hearts in regards to this wave pool. Um, we would love to hear what are your thoughts about the development of this third wave pool and please share with the utmost aloha your dearest sentiment regarding um, the impact that it could possibly make for you, your ohana, or your community. Your thoughts on the wave pool and how it will affect you, your family, and your community. Um, I think it's really offensive that they even have. You know, they shouldn't even have built one. I mean, it's just a waste of water, you know, when our people could be using that water to grow food. You know, unfortunately, millions of gallons for pools and using our water as a commodity that's not what our vibe is made for the vibe belongs to the people right so to the mahiai so the farmers so we can grow food to sustain ourselves the whole point is sustainability right now if the ships stop coming in we're screwed you know so we have to start planting and planting it to protect our ivy and protect our aina and protect our vai protect our mauna, whatever we got to protect, we're going to protect. Mahalo. So beautifully well said. Let's share it with the rest of our panel. What are your thoughts on this development wave pool as the third one within the Eva Moku? How will it impact you, your ohana, and your community? So just looking at the second wave pool and how it's already impacted the community, it's already been negative. Um, after reading the guidelines that was given to me by Joe here earlier about these injection wells and things of that nature, it just seems like a repeat of history again and again. I think it's very um, disrespectful. And I also think that people need to start thinking about really what they, they have to already start allowing for this thing to say, hey, you know what? Whatever these guys have been doing has not been working. We have other people who have things that can work, and things work sometimes without other people navigating all of the information and the businesses because of it. So I think it's going to be even worse. Um, there has to be a way to stop it. This is the second time that we came over here with the family. And if you're... This is the way I look at it, coming home and not really being in the movement all my life, is think about your, if you have family here and their bones are in the memorials, you get families buried somewhere and they just rip them out and they just throw them everywhere. And you cannot think that there's going to be good energy from that. Like There's not good mana and power that comes from that. And it's just to continue to desecrate um, whilst speaking tongues and sweet languages like you're helping is, is just really wasting a lot of people's time and it's going to create a very short term big impact when like what Kahaka was saying no more food coming in you know no more you don't have the capability because you're not connected to your families to go get water from the Aina so you have to start thinking about when the ships don't come in and the people have to start acting like they're not going to come in and start connecting with their families to make sure we have food and water and safety and houses and things like that for each of us. That's what should be over here, not, sorry, but foreigners from other places who, because they think they have money, they can buy up all the aina and they think that they can sell out 
what doesn't belong to them. And I think that's very wrong. I think it's not Pono, and I think it needs to be stopped immediately. Wow. So a, a lot to unpack in that. The, <laughs> the impact of what is happening out of here in, in Eva. Let, let's think about this for a minute. This is the third water a wave pool. What is the impact on our Aina? Right? We already know what's happening, but when you take water away and we already have a water shortage, and now you're going to take more water away to fill in more water pool, wave pool, what does that mean for all of us? We already have a lot of development going out here in the Eva community, building houses, building more homes, more homes, more homes. Now you're going to take the water. So where are we going to take the water away from? Ka'ala? Where are we going to take the water away from? Up in Wahiwa? Where are we going to take the water away from so that you can have water over here in the pool? Oh, wait. We're going to take them from the underground water system that we get in the area. What does that mean? When you take that water away, I want you guys to think of Lahaina. <laughs> There's exactly the same thing that happened in Lahaina. They had underground water systems. Lahaina used to be flush with green. Today you look at it as very brown because you divert their water away. You take away the underground water system. When you take away the underground water system, the trees no more way for root. They have no, no place to grow from. What is the impact does that mean? If we don't have any more trees, we don't have no more oxygen. If we don't have any more oxygen means we don't have no more limo growing. We don't have anything growing, right? Because stuff starts to die. So what is the impact? Is that we're going to see it very real right here because no more water. If water, like I said earlier, water is life and we're not taking care of that water, we're not taking care of it, then what does that mean? We're not going to be living either, right? No. She mentioned something about the, the Aina and the, and the burial places. We have OEV. We found some this morning, this afternoon. More OEV right back behind us. Let's think about this for a minute. How would you feel if um, Punch Bowl Cemetery became a wave pool? They take all of the bones, all the EV out of there. Say, oh, they're going to make them into a wave pool because we can. How would you feel? How about some of the downtown cemeteries? We're going to turn them into wave pools just because we can. Does that mean you should? No, but because you can, we go do it. How would you feel about your OEV being desecrated? How would you feel about your family being lost? Because when the OEV is lost, when the OEV is gone, your family is lost. Your ancestors are lost. What does that mean for you now? You know more place to go. They know more place to go. Just think about that for a little while. I'm sure we get more questions. We're gonna get yeah. more deeper into this. But just think about that for a little bit. I'm gonna turn over to you. Mahalo. Oh, how does this impact me? So, I so I think first and foremost about what the situation is still going on with Kapukaki, um, first and foremost. And I'm reminded that <clears throat> there were a lot of people that said, oh, I don't live in that area, so it doesn't affect me at all. <sighs> Sorry, that's boo. It affects us mm -hmm. regardless. Yeah. And so, like I said in my Ho'olauna, um, I'm not from this place specifically. Yeah. I, I know bits and pieces of Mo'olelo of this place. I'm trying to learn more so I can understand what this place was and what this place still can be. Yeah. But, <clears throat> and so I mentioned earlier that although I'm from Waianae, every single part of this Mokupuni has an effect on me and it is my kuleana um, as well as every kanaka maoli kuleana to malama regardless of where it is where we are standing to malama i um i'm an olelo hawaii teacher and so yeah this drastically affects me and my students and the future of our generation this wa wave pool being built is being built on Aina that we still learning about. And if you build on here, oh, how the stories that our students and our future generation are going to build, how are they going to build relationship with the stories if they cannot see the places and spaces that we're talking about, yeah? And that goes for every single place that's being built upon, a sacred place that's being built upon on our, on our islands. Um, one was enough, two is too much, three is just bullshit. Kalamai, there is no need 
for another wave pool, especially in this moko. I, um, thinking about the desecration that would cause to our marine life, to our ecosystem, our ecosystem, our, our hydrological system, the EV of this aina. Yeah? We in this dire strait right now because we don't know how to take care of our EVs anymore. Right? And we need to return to that. Malama ika EV. Yeah? And then we know how to malama the aina. And when we do that, then we know how to malama ourselves and our future generation. So I am so against this third wave pool. We live on an island. <laughs> there is no reason why we have to pay money for going surf when we get this beautiful ocean surrounding us. It's just a waste of money. It's a waste of land uh, and a waste of just life in general. I waste of life in general. I so I don't cock or this one bit at all. Kalamai, I love the Keolanas. I love what they do for my moku. Um, <clears throat> but I I I pai pai ya oko. Yeah, I encourage you guys to actually learn a little bit more about this moku through our olelo. I it olelo brings life I to all of our spaces and places. And the only way we learn that is when we start to speak it. I, and so I, I encourage you, Brian, to get to know your Olelo because I know you said that you never know. I am here to teach you. I, you can come and join me, but through that language, you can understand and see a, uh, a different perspective of what, how we connect, how we as Kanaka Maoli connect to the Aina. And so, I. Hello, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you go, you go, you go. Okay, mahalo for that beautiful input. It seems to be there's a consensus, Kalamai, a consensus um, with our interviewees today, um, their deep heartfelt sentiment about um, their connection to this moku. And with that being said, I would like to ask each and every one of you, what are some ideas? You know, a lot of the people, in, I can't even think of one person who came by and said they're in agreement uh, for this development. I, we're in the second day. I have not heard one person. We've even gone to the restroom down the road and somebody was like, hey, yeah, that's you guys down the road. You know what? I like, can I just tell you guys, I'm not for it. And I'm a like, I'm not for it. We get the most beautiful oceans out here. Why? I don't understand. So. The sentiment thus far has been um, so encouraging for what we're doing because, again, I have not seen one person who have said, I'm for it, because the, of the impact that it's going to create for themselves, their keiki, and their community. And so with that, um, your next question for each of you is, can you share with those who are listening some ideas that could make better use of this aina. Each of you come from a different aspect of a protector, kia'i. All of you serve within your communities as leaders in the capacity that you're being called. And with that kuleana that you have chosen to awamo, um, I would like you to share, if you can, some ideas that could help foster better resolution to this aina because um, maybe people need that creative insight from the people from within our community and throughout the pai aina and those of you who are watching you know we encourage you to drop your um, sentiments as well as ideas of better use for this aina instead of a wave pool because maybe that's what needs to be encouraged and we would like to hear what our community members have to say about a better idea for use of this area? Plant food, I mean, come on, it's a no-brainer. We have to put food in the ground. I mean, we're like way, way behind. Um, we needed food in the ground like yesterday. I mean, it's very important and imperative, but I don't think our, anybody sees the severity situation that we're in. Because the shopping containers, I mean, shipping containers that come in, we're messed up. You know, so definitely food, restore the water. My recommendation is shut down these two wave pools that never, doesn't even make sense to exist. Shut them down, restore the water back to the people. 
to the mahi ai to the farmers to the kanaka can grow food or grow our medicine. You know, we need land and water. They go hand in hand. And you can't just give us land and then no more water. You know, so it goes back to Konohiki, right? <coughs> so you look on your royal patent. If, if a kupuna was in Konohiki, they was in charge of the water. Then that's your ohana, step forward. That's why you're here. You know, uh, Kekawa Nohi, yeah, ohana. My LCA 11216. Yeah, if you want Kekawa Nohi, yeah, eh, halamai, kako, you know, cousins. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. What's your insight of a better solution, idea um, to spark creative flow for those who are in charge, who are facilitating this land use and permitting? What are some better use ideas coming directly from people within our community? For, so first and foremost, we got to get rid of the state. It's an unlawful human trafficking operation, period, end of discussion. We are the lawfuls of the land. We have to work together. That's what we have. I've heard since I've been home. And thank God I'm in seats with these people here because they are making a difference. Um, it's really hard for people to look beyond the work that needs to be done. And so I think that we need to gamify things to get people out so that it's not like so rigid and only um, like if we rewarded people for planting instead of just mm. acting like because we have to bring people off the fiat currency money system we have to bring them off the you working as an employee for one corporation but you could be working and spending the same amount of time as yourself inside like what Kahaka's talking about maybe you out at the fish farm maybe you planting more um, seaweed right maybe you over here you looking at the water table now Maybe you're a part of the journey. And I think what I have witnessed from when I came home is that the Kanaka, the mighty, the strong, the censorship of the people who control the fiat money systems and all the systems, they shut you down. They shut me down. They shut, that's the one thing I have in common. When the information cannot be shared, nobody can hear you, right? And you praying and hoping that out of people hearing you, but and they do because you're putting the energy out there. But um, making things fun and rewarding and educational, those things can be done even right from home. You don't have to be going and doing it from one school anymore. But we can make these places diff like schools, right? And we can, everybody who came out here today, if they was recording, they would have evidence. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at it as we are the evidence that we have to put out. And Queen Leokalani never have one cell phone, she never have internet, they never even have fax machines, they have to use ships. But now we get our own technologies and we can introduce, adopt. Um, and definitely you need to farm because when the ships don't come in, those who aren't farming and those who aren't preparing is really going to be hard to put you first at the front of the line when only get one limited amount of supply at a time. So um, those are just some ideas. And uh, Joe, oh, thank, you. Well, <laughs> thank you for those great ideas. Um, lots of, lot of great information there. So let, let's think about what it is that we can be doing. If we are up, totally relying on the state to provide everything for us or on the federal government to provide things for us, we're relying on the wrong source, right? We're forgetting about the power of the people right here, sitting right here, the power within our own communities. If you're looking for ideas as to what we can do, let's just look back at our own history and our own in our own lands and what the people would do. What would, what would the, the protectors of a particular area, what would they do? They would have to protect the ocean, you got to protect the mountain, and you got to protect everything in between, especially if that's in your ahupua'a. Right? You have to take care of those things. If we're not taking care of the ocean, let's just think about this now. You know? The water run out to the ocean, we're not taking care of the ocean because we took the water away. That means the limo not going to grow, right? Because it needs that kind of a, that consistency between yeah. the ocean and the land water. It needs that brine mesh there to, for the limo to grow. If the limo don't grow, then what? The small fish don't eat. Right. The small fish don't eat, the big fish don't eat. Right. The big fish don't eat, we the don't turtles eat. don't eat. We don't eat. <laughs> Nothing happens because we're not eating off of the ocean. We're only then surviving off of the land. So if we were to look at where that came from and where we're going to go to, we're going to need to look right there. We start right there. Okay? 
protecting our grounds, protecting our land. That's the first thing I think we got to do is protect these areas, especially this site, so that we're not destroying, creating more problems, losing more water. Think about it. We got more development going on right now in this area alone. Think about it. Why? Where all that water coming from? But if you're going to put one wave pool in here, you're going to need more water, more water, more water, because we're building more houses, so you're going to need more water, and then pretty soon, no more water <laughs> for us. Do you think we could run out of water? Is a possibility. What are your thoughts? Do I think we could run out of water? Oh boy. Um, okay, yes, we could, but here's the difference is there are always alternatives. There's always technologies, Kalei mentioned that a minute ago, that we could be using to, to increase the water. Right? We can do a lot of things for drinking water and stuff like that. There's technologies available, whether it be desalinization type plants, water atmospheric generators. There's a lot of different things that we could be using in the area, but that's not going to replace what we need or what the water we have underground. Mm -hmm. That's going to be good for us for drink, yes. right? Yes. But not going to be good for the land to drink, not going to be good for the ocean to drink, right? And that's what we really got to be looking at. So the ideas. Hold on one second. <laughs> The ideas would basically be using the technologies that we have available to us to increase our productivity on this land. Yeah. And I'm going to turn that over to you. And Mahalo. Okay. Um, so I kind of thought about this. And, and like I said, I don't, I don't, I'm not really familiar with this Aina to kind of gauge what would benefit the, Aina, um, the people of this community. However, I... Um, I'm really keen about taking care of our people on the coastline. And uh, it's super important, like all of us have said, um, we seek food sovereignty um, as a, a very high priority in, in that, well, it should be a high priority in our lives. Um, and so <clears throat> what better way than to kill two birds with one stone, you know, make this place some sort of um, community-based um, planting, mala garden where we can actually give purpose back to our people that are on the coastline um and um yeah that and then i know there's some burial i was just looking at the map behind here um to see where the archaeological um sites are at and i see that there are a few within the boundaries of this project um and we need to make sure that we protect that yeah so like having a Hawaiian Cultural Center here, you know, to teach our people, you know, how to grow limo again, um, how to malama the aina again, yeah, um, <clears throat> how to take care of our evies that are buried here all over again, yeah, um, just like I said, we forgot, we forgot how to do that, yeah, he kawa ke kanaka. Right? The land is chief, we are but its servants, and we need to return back mm. to serve our right. aina that right. flourishes us continuously if we take care of her. Right? And once we stop, and a lot of us have stopped and forgotten, um, that's why it's the way that it is, and that's why people are, are um, so quick to build upon our kupuna, mm. right? uh, behind closed doors yeah. even yeah. you know and so <sighs> that's just a couple of ideas that's been like festering in my mind not just for this moku but for all over yes. you know we need okay. community restoration um through and through Hi. Mahalo. um you know i never got to share live or in any capacity uh, for myself, I, I would like to chime in into this response. And as a kumu myself um, in science, I, I'm a ed teacher, but my specialty is science. Um, I began writing a grant three years ago for a remediation project on our aina that we won in Maui um, in 2019, one of Hawaii's longest unadjudicated cases. Um, and part of the idea came from Kupuna that our people need healing. And when you heal the people, you bring back life force to them, but it takes them being on the aina. And so when you put the people on the aina, not in a high rise, um, 
they have to be connected because Mother Earth is a positive energy force. And I'm just going to share a little bit about energy. Um, we pick up negative energies, whether it be by the foods we ingest, the toxins in the air, engagements with people verbally. We pick up negative energy. Mother Earth is a positive energy. And so when you place your feet upon the lepo, you place your feet upon the soil, positive and negative attract. She actually will remove negative energy through your feet or by sitting with her, hugging a tree, just being present in the aina um, or in the mala, in the lo'i, at the ocean. There is a natural response that happens within your energetic field and that is the releasing of negative energies because of the positive and negative connection. And so when we understand that our people have been born in a war, they've been raised in a war, and we are growing in this war that we were desensitized to recognize. Um, the healing is the most pivotal part in strengthening the mind to work in harmony, body, mind, and spirit. And so I believe our people could benefit from a um, reforestation, a remediation of the aina um, we have six generations that have compounded generational trauma within their kino, within their energetic field, and within the aina. And all of that needs healing. And it cannot occur if we're continued to be separated from the life force which heals us, which is Papahanao Muku. And so, for me, a wave pool does nothing for the healing of our people. I don't, I'm, and I'm going to say this, people's name does not bring mana to the healing of our people. It is the hana that they give back to allow, to facilitate, for healing to occur. Our people have been suffering. We don't see it because we are taught single person born on this paiaina and of the koko. Either or, if you're born here, not of the koko, you still, in, you're impacted by the trauma of generational trauma and of the koko. Now you inheriting all of this and the aina has trauma, the wars, the desecration, it's compounded. So for me, it would be beautiful to see keikis come here and to kanu their mana, specifically the keiki from this ahupua'a because it is the reciprocation of that mana that builds within that harmonious balance from like Nani had just shared, um, it's pivotal. It's pivotal for the healing. You have to have the people from the Ahupua'a come, return their mana because it's reciprocated, vice versa. Mother Earth gonna release, take away the negative, and then you give love back because now you feel better. That's the reciprocation of healing. And we can do that through the acts of, we don't always have to take, right? We don't always have to come somewhere and take, take, take. It's the exchange of gratitude. I love Papa Hanau Moku, so I'm gonna pick up rubbish wherever I go, teach my kids, pick up rubbish. This place can benefit for a healing center for the next generation yeah. to come heal their mind by putting kanumana energy, release what is toxic, leave feeling good. And our kids from schools, from the community can come here and rebuild a communal um, place to partake and grow food and also remediate the aina. There's so much we can do to heal. When you heal the aina, you're healing yourself in the process. And for me, that's way better use than a wave pool because a wave pool is all commerce, it's all contracts, it's all currency that is not even real. And so we're chasing this, this ideology of how do we feel comfortable in this timeline right now in the existence of all people in the world is we feel like we need money to be comfortable. And it's not money. It's not money. The eha that we feel, the desire that we chase comes from that attachment to money, that I need more to, to feel better, to make sure I get food, to pay the bills, to put gas, to go work. We're chasing something that is not created for us. A wave pool is not created for our success. Only certain people are gonna profit and benefit from that. And regardless of your name and regardless of your iconic status, anybody, and I'm not just referring to this development, anybody throughout the Pai Aina, we need to, talk, we need to think about healing our people because when you heal one generation, you're actually healing all generations. 
because time is not linear, it's actually overlapping. Past, present, and future exist within the same continuum. And as you heal yourself, you're actually healing your parents and your grandparents and your children. So your healing in itself heals backwards. And when it heals backwards, heals backwards to your kupuna, that energy mana comes right back to you and then it transcends to your keiki. And so for me, seeing keiki over here, remembering what it means to be kanaka, to love the aina, is to heal our kupuna and to heal papahana moku. So that was my little interview, precursor interview, because I think we're doing us guys tomorrow. So, okay. Evie, question very sensitive topic uh, we've asked every person who has been here today and those who are um, mahalo to those who have opted to take the question by email we will be sharing your responses on our page nakia Vaiha. we will have who we interviewed and their response so please tune in for those because there's a lot of different aspects of people in service in our community and we will, we will be sharing their responses as well so we asked everybody that came today um, there is Evie on this aina the burial council was made known as well as as well as the developer the developer was there the burial council was put on notice that um ohana from this paiaina this vahipana was not okay and that was the main sentiment uh at that council meeting is that nobody wants the ev to be disinterred so to our panel of um interviewees today I want to make sure I have this correct. Um, do you believe it's acceptable morally to remove gra graves for commercial profit? As such the case with this wave pool. Um, the understanding is this project is still moving forward, I, I believe. And um, the EV is a concern. So is it morally responsible or even acceptable to disinter for commercial profit? No, that's highly disrespectful to our kupuna. And um, why? Well, Fair. first of all, you know, you it's a huge kuleana to take on to protect kupuna evi. I mean, it's a lifelong thing, you know, to commit. Oh, oh excuse me, to, I forgot what I was saying now. <laughs> is, is it okay to take out evi for commercial profit? Oh, no. Our uh, EV is supposed to remain where they are, okay? You, the whole point is that they had a lot of mana. That's why they tried to hide it. So they're not supposed to be, you know, uncovered and moved. You know, there's EV there and there's EV. No, I mean, you can't even build around it or near it. There's EV, there's EV. You cannot. And it's, no, absolutely not. Not an option. No. Mahalo. Mahalo. Sorry, I'm going to cut to me because I got to go. <laughs> But um, that is a big no, an absolute no. Uh, no to, to move, removing any EV from their place of resting, yeah? Um, and it's hard for people that are not of Hawaii to really understand that, yeah? Um, our kupunas are sacred to us. Um, their bones are even more sacred to us because when their bones are buried, the nutrients that come from their bones goes into the ground and into the plants that we plant. And then it comes into us from when we eat the plants. And it's a continuous, continuous reciprocating movement of life. Yeah. And not everybody understands that. Um, and so it's super important for people who are not from here to understand that deepness, that richness, that manifulness of our connection to our kupuna, our relationship to our kupuna. They belong where they're at. They don't belong dug up. If I were to come to your hale and dig up your grandparents, how would you feel about that? That is not pono. No matter where you live, that's not pono. I, and so think about that, because if I had money, I came to you and just dug up your freaking ground. Really, what would you do? 
How would you feel? You need to know how we feel. You need to understand that. And the only way you're going to understand that is come talk to us. Come realize what our truth is, what our reasons are, what our EV bones could actually provide for all of us. Not just for me, not just for us individually, but for Kako. Kako. Hi. And so, no, they should not be removed ever, ever, ever. Oh, yeah, Valeno. Kiko Pau. Kiko Pau. Wow. Pretty deep, yeah. Um, so, my, my sentiment, my feeling is, again, is no, should never be disturbed. I kind of touched on some things earlier. Sister touched on, uh, Nani touched on some things. Again, if it was your grandparents, how you feel? How would you feel about them being dug up and moved someplace else? Yeah? They're in the ground for a specific reason. How are you going to feel that way? If it was Punchbowl Cemetery, you're going to dig them all up, move them somewhere else because, oh, do we just feel like moving them around, right? Um, if it was Arlington Cemetery, what about that in D.C.? What if we just come through, destroy that whole thing, dig them up, and build new buildings over there just because we can, right? Or if it's any other cemetery anywhere, you're going to go just destroy everybody in there, move them, take them away, and move them someplace else just because we want to put in a wave pool. Yeah, I or any other development, not necessarily even a wave pool, but any other development. But you want to take out that person that was there, that was buried, that's connected to that ground. You're going to take them away, and you're going to do what? We're going to move them someplace else. But they're not from there. They're not from someplace else. Mm -hmm. They're from here. Why are you going to take them out from here and move them someplace else? That's not their home. Their home is over here. Yeah, you got to think about that. But and Sister Nani was talking about very real, right? Very true. What Trina was talking about, right? You got to be aware of these things. You got to be aware of our, our, who we are touching in our ground that we are talking and walking and living on. Who are we talking with when we do that, right? Just think about that, guys. Think about that. Mahalo. Hmm. Need the question? What's the question? Same question. Same question. So, um, EV is it ac morally acceptable for commercial profit? Big no. Um, everything here is immoral. You have the state, a provisional government, a de facto non-duly voted in weaponized force that has been here since 1893 and even before that. They had their eyes set on the prize. Um, they've been desecrating other places where there's EV at anyways. And so to me, the, the real question is, is how long are you going to tolerate not being heard or coming out or being one sell out and going to go work a job for the people who are desecrating even you in your psyche, which is what we were talking about before. And um, when you actually start to put together the facts and findings and conclusions of law and you genuinely understand and you genuinely want to comprehend it, there is a resounding no annexation document, which means everything that is happening, we shouldn't be crying anymore. We should be rising up super powerful, super strong, because they don't morat. And if you kanaka Maoli and your mom die and you think about somebody that digging them up and throwing them someplace else and putting one profit center in and you get zero of it and then you gonna hum out the whole time that's basically what they've been doing to me and my evaluation of coming home and reading for myself and having comprehension of the scenario there is no way that money especially fiat currency going to one corporate entity one corporal fiction which is a war criminal we should not be paying war criminals to get the job done or expect that they're going to get the job done or that they care enough about us and your families, whether you're a citizen here unlawfully or Kanaka here or you think you Hawaiian here. These are the things if we all came together to discuss, you would find out, wow, we all get the same enemy and it's not each other. So that's what I think about it. Mahalo. Same consensus. Seems to be a sentiment that a lot of people share and seems we're all on the same vibrational frequency that is being touched in their pu'uvai and they're sharing through their leo. So mahalo you guys for sharing that. So we got two questions. One is um, we're going to talk about injection wells. Are you folks familiar with injection wells? Okay, so injections wells, I'm just going to share a little tidbit. 
It's um, the use of forced uh, release wastewater uh, into the karst system out here in order to dispose of wastewater. So the wave pool um, has proposed in their environmental assessment to you with their uh, attempting to use injection wells to facilitate wastewater disposal. And that would require dumping it into the karst system. And the karst system, as Joe had touched a little bit earlier, for those of you who are watching, our karst system is very, very important to our Kanaka Maoli people. Not only was some of them used to house EV bones of our ancestors, um, but it also allowed for subsurface water, so underground water, to move from Mauka to Makai. And in that traverse of the water, it actually moved um, nutrient-dense uh, matter for the limu and for that ecosystem that thrives from that nutrient-dense uh, matter. So it's going to come through the car system, exit at the ocean side, and then allow our limu to feed off of it, um, because it will create brackish water which helps the limu to thrive including the, the, the nutrients that are coming down through the karst system um, but that creates nutrients for small fish species the kala because they eat limu kala um, and then uh, turtles eat limu crustaceans eat limu and it just creates this trickle effect where at the end of that is us we eat from that so now if the injection wells is using uh, our car system to dispose of wastewater that's going to impact the entire ecosystem all the way down to us we've already lost half of our limo beds um, due to the water diversions that are happening within EVA for the development I think their population is at 50,000 plus of homes and you can imagine um, I don't even know how water pressure is maintained in the EVA Moku with those many homes now if we're going to dump wastewater into the karst system, it's going to create a big detriment for everything that relies on that Mauka to Makai water. So what are your thoughts on their proposed use of injection wells? What are your thoughts? Do you think it's a great way to release wastewater? Should it not be considered? Um, in general, what do you think about that because they can't have the wave pool because they don't have a way to dispose of water and if that's their only way to dispose of water i want to hear your folks thoughts no <laughs> <laughs> play no you know um see again the impacts right all the dis wastewater and you're gonna put it no 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 you know you can see no it's it's not an option i mean you're not gonna force this on us you know we cannot no, absolutely, absolutely. Aole, Okay, mahalo. So what I learned about being home is the state buys themselves time between the propaganda, the media, and the ability to fund projects, whether they're grants or military contracts or whatever the case. It's from what I've observed, it's always we're trying to help, we're trying to help. If you had your toilets overflowing in your household every day, that's what you should expect will come from this. If you want to go take a shower down at the community center, um, you should accept, accept, expect due to water coming out. Um, you should expect to drink that. If you go to the ocean, you should get mahali rot. Okay, like this is common sense. Pollution in, pollution out. And so if they keep on putting up more houses and they're not even to the bungalows and they did seven million gallon water pools and there's more than one pool, there was plural. Um, entertainment is all I see. Yeah, and destruction and damage. So by them going in and doing this, they're gonna ruin the other coral tables that are still underneath here that they haven't destroyed yet between the military and the state. And we can come back over and we can go through and we can go fix it. But to trust people that have constantly been in perpetual genocide is ignorant. Um, and it is not a way that you can defend yourself when the time comes. And I think that the awakening is coming for all of us to recognize this and plan this year because like Josh Green said, in 18 months from Lahaina, he gonna bring in the smart city. Mm. So if you're going to rely on smart dummy for teach you who get no heart, 
who are willing to instill all this kind poho stuff over here um, and like unity by being the only person that can keep committing war crimes. I challenge you to think a little bit differently because there are people now that are not going to put up with it because we get our own resources, we get our own funding. We don't rely on the federal fiat dollar or the system. So the question for everybody is why are you? More better you come over here and talk to your family members and find out who your Pili Coco is and then go learn this stuff. Because when I read this today, I was blown away because all it looks like is a toilet bowl and we're a part of the bean in the, in the doo-doo and you cannot wash off the shishi and the doo-doo and, and that's how it's going to be. And then what? You're going to be crying later. Yeah, that's smart move is come out this year, come out now, come learn about this. Ask yourself these questions and ask yourself how it's going to affect you if you're the person that's not the billionaire. You're the person that's not the millionaire. You're the one going in and working one job for the people who are killing you and the terrorism. That's the way I see it. So if you can just I'll expect me to trust them, the answer is no for me because they're already proving. Since I've been home the last five years, that's all I see is desecration. Desec it doesn't matter whether it's psychological. It doesn't matter whether it's environmental, the water, the water table. We're just fighting with... Red Hill, the military, it's, it's an unlawful and an unend occupation. It needs to end, and we need to say no to federal dollars, fiat dollars, and no to any legalese, because that is, that's the language that keeps on pushing out the shit. Pardon my French, <laughs> but for real. <clears throat> so let, let's think about what an injection well is or what it is doing. And essentially, it is pushing... <laughs> Oh, hold on one second. It is pushing, they dig a big hole, and you're pushing doodle waste stuff down into this hole, right? Let's think about that for a minute. That's what you're doing. You're pushing it down here. But what's inside of this? You're pushing this down inside of the water table. If you're pushing it in the water table, what does that mean? It's eventually going to come out of the water table and going to come into where? Into your house. It's going to come into your your home going to come into the sewer lines, the water lines, going to come into your house. And you're going to wonder why you have a doo smell in your house all the time. Because the water is coming in through the table. Now, Board of Water Supply goes, oh no, we're going to clean all that up. We're going to do all this kind of stuff. We're going to put everything in here. But think about it for a minute. We said the same thing with Red Hill. Oh, we're not going to have to worry about fuels dropping down into the water table. Guess what? <laughs> 70 years later, fuel is dropping into the water table. Was anybody aware of that? No. They're going to build this concrete liner around these injection wells. And oh, no, it's not going to ever go inside anywhere else. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys right now. That's bullshit. Okay? It's going to go somewhere else. It's going to go into the water. It's going to go into the fresh water. It's going to go into the drinking water. And pretty soon it's going to go everywhere. Right? And then when you're complaining about that because, oh, I live in town. I don't have to worry about what happened out here in Eva. I'm not going to worry about that. Well, we could have said the same thing in Eva when we said, oh, Red Hill, that's what's happening in town. We don't need to worry about that. But guess what? It, it comes over here too. Lahaina, oh, that's in Lahaina. We don't have to worry about what happened in Lahaina. We know what happened in Lahaina, right? The same thing is going to happen. To you to say we're not, we're going to line these injection wells and we are going to be safe for the next 50 years. I'm going to tell you guys, that's bullshit. That's lies. They lying to you. Whoever telling you that's not, they lying to you. Because that's what's going to happen. Somebody making money off of this. Somebody making money. Okay. But it's not us. It's nobody over here. But it doesn't matter. That's not the point. Never mind about making the money. When you cannot drink water because the water is all pilau. Have fun with that one. Right? Oh, but the water park was so important. The wave pool was so important. Right? It was so important, but today we're not drinking water. Our grandchildren are not drinking water. We don't have no water to drink, but it was so important to put this wave pool in here. Uh, Aole. <laughs> it's bad news, guys. Bad news. Mahalo. Seems again, same sentiment. <laughs> there seems to be a consensus uh, again. Question after question, you know, everyone seems to share the same understanding. So we may need to 
raise our voices collectively a little louder because the people who need to hear this are not hearing it. They're not hearing it. Um, just by a yes or no, are you folks aware that HCDA had petitioned the county to change the zoning permits that directly correlates with the development of this waifu? They amended the zoning, so it initially um, did not allow for little cottages to be erected here so that people could sleep over. And I'm just asking, in general, yes or no, were you folks aware that um, HCDA, who is the so-called subsidiary title holder for the land under the county and the state, had directly changed permitting in order to facilitate expansion for this development? No. 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 Okay, so what does that mean for those of you out there who are listening is that um, there seems to be a modification to the plans and I spoke against the zoning uh, change and even though 100% of representation from the community said no to the zoning change um, to allow for these cottages to occur, which now becomes an expansion on wastewater again. Not not just the way food going to be wasting water, but now you got bungalows where people are going to create more wastewater, more lepo, more feces, more pee, more trash. And the permitting was modified to allow the this development to modify their plans in order to allow for those cottages. And I just want to put that out there to you folks. Yeah, the city council is the real the criminals. You know, they're the ones that are, you know, changing the permits, you know. It is hard because, you know, being the, the track record of corruption, you know, it runs deep, you know, and it's it's really rough up here. And um, what did you say about that? Though? Were you aware that they changed the permitting to allow for this place to now allow for cottages? No, no. And, and who, why are they changing it? Okay? No, it's not okay. They need to not mahaoi and think they're gonna build this over here no they're not doing it no it's not okay they gotta stop doing heba you know what i mean stop doing that but what it comes down to is the heirs the heirs are being called people come and call call mahalo yes thank you you can hold that um actually i said two questions two questions ago but this will be, <laughs> since we know you folks are not in agreement with the waifu, the last question is, um, what are your thoughts of the waifu being built directly in the lena of the spirits that travel all the way from Kapukaki through here? Because Kalailoa, if those of you who aren't aware, um, Kalailoa is the place of wandering spirits. So our spirits come here and they actually get guided by the Aumakua to transition and lele off of this physical plane. And we are currently in the lena of that traversing for spirits. Mm -hmm. So my question to the co community members here is, um, what are your thoughts and sentiments regarding erecting um, the wave pool in the path of this spiritual lena that is established by miles? <laughs> no can because I mean my thoughts it's, it's ridiculous because spiritually now this is kind of stuff that you don't want to mess with when I come to spiritual mana kind of stuff it's not a game you know you cannot you know it's really really serious stuff what was the other one um how, what are your sentiments how do you feel about them building it on the spiritual path oh no no can no can because they're gonna come they're gonna come because that's their path and they're gonna come and you in their path uh, excuse me um they're gonna reach out and touch you or something you know it's not it's not pono i mean you don't want to go on that side especially trust me as being a spiritual person you do not want to mess with that dark side like that no I don't. Yeah. mahalo what are your thoughts and sentiments about the lena last question the lane the development being built over the lena um like kahaka i agree it's, you guys are heard about the night marches when you was young yep. so if you think that you're going to have one positive business structure even as evil and corrupt as you are, there are spiritual things that you just can't control. And we all know, everybody in this aina has experienced life force of some sort that they either couldn't figure out or don't understand, but the mana is so powerful, there's guidance. And then on the ley lines, that's the whole reason why they occupy in Hawaii, because 
We get the Kumulipo. We was we was the first. So to hide the story behind colonial biblical interpretation and all this kind of stuff, that's where I I just I cannot comprehend how somebody else's tyrannical fascism and beliefs that come over here and do all of this stuff for 131 years and think that oh my God, we're gonna still trust these people because they they nice on the surface, but the reality is. Like the night marcher is going to come out. The people are going to start to come out because they're only going to push everybody into a corner. And then when everybody finally realizes they're looking at who really loved them in their face mm -hmm. and they never sell out to the corporations, mm -hmm. then they're going to be like, oh, oh, now we're going to get together because now you might be in one physical war. You might be in one revolution if they push mm -hmm. you into that part, right? To have the spiritual guidance of our ancestors coming through the land means pay attention. And because we're not paying attention and we're so distracted by e entertainment and all this other kind of stuff going on and working one job and having one salary and all this legally stuff, that's why we're not even centering with our families or within ourselves because that stress, that anxiety, that is like, it's living one daily hell and torture. And then you guys don't come and say, oh, we're going to build one other thing over here. And then if the kupuna come and the EV raise up, you guys gonna make any kind of stories about them? No. You guys gonna have to. You gonna have to bear the energy like the rest of us holding space from the kupuna. So the answer is negative. Don't ever do that. You want. You don't want us to disrespect respect you like that. Don't disrespect us like that. Oh wow. So, <laughs> well, they, they give it to me, right? I get to I get to carry this over. But let, let's think about this. I, I want to try to put this into a context for people to understand. We know when our peoples die, the spirit moves from east to west. We know that, mm -hmm. right? We can look at it in Mokapu in the morning. There's a reason why Mokapu in Kaneohe is called the, the Bay of Mist. It's because the spirits are traveling from <coughs> east to west. They still continue. If you are on a spiritual line traveling from east to west, where are you coming through? Right through here. If you are heading out towards Kaena, because you're going to the next place to go forward. If you're going to Kaena, you ever notice how much problems you have at Kaena Point? They cannot build a road. They cannot build a railway. They cannot build anything around there because you have so much spiritual movement that anything they try to build in Kaena has always had issues. <coughs> Every single time, whether it was a road whether it was buildings, whether it was anything. Why? Because you have the spiritual movement. If you are putting a building or a facility right in the middle of a spiritual line, what do you think is going to happen to that building? The building's gonna have something happen. They're gonna have issues in that building continuously over and over and over and over. It's going to happen. They haven't never been able to build a, a railway. They have never been able to build a roadway around Kaena. Why? Because it's right in that spiritual line. Think about that for a minute as you try to process and try to build your facility on a spiritual line. What does that gonna mean for you? <laughs> problems. Have fun yeah. with that one, bro. <laughs> Plenty of problems. <laughs> Just think about that. Put on, take, take off your Caucasian, take off your every Americanization of things, and put on your Hawaiian and think about that, guys. Think about that. You know in your na'au that is not right. You know that because why well, you can feel it. It's not yeah. going to be good. Yeah. You're not going to have a good time in your building over there. Just think about that. Okay. Sorry, guys. Oh, no, so last one. one. Okay. In fact, I have I have to share because it's uh, um, actually there is a place of Moko Keave. I think it's Mountain View. And um, exact same thing. They wouldn't put structures in the pathway. So every year there was suicide, murder. Cause there was from some natives from America bought some land, and so right down the street, there's always why? Cause they want to build them in front of the path. I forget which Amoko boat. They basically put them in a path. Mm -hmm. So now there's been death, suicide. I mean, just all oh, Hana, you know. So it does exist. Amoko Keabe. I mean, you I haven't gone close, it, but yeah, I witnessed it. So it's it's real. Mahalo. So guys, thank you for watching. We just want to mahalo our community members and leaders who serve our communities to make great changes that are here. 
um, to share their ike and their manao um, in re and sentiment in regards to this wave pool. Um, so for those of you who are watching far and wide, please share this video. Please check out nakiaiovaiha.com. That's our website. We also have our Instagram page. Um, Rewatch the video. See if that enlightens you a little bit. You know, there's so much sentiment shared today. We had interviews all day long. Um, our community is crying for change not this kind of change this is not positive effect that's going to benefit our people 150 jobs that um only 150 people are going to benefit i mean one bag of groceries is 150 dollars at this point how much can you make here at a wave pool that's going to be subsistence living for yourself rather than just planting food why are we not just having a commun a communal garden um Anywho, today is day two of Nakia i Ovaiha, holding it down, raising awareness and bringing in community sentiment and feelings straight to you, the world, our community, our moku, our paiaina. Um, please listen to the people, support, share, like, sign our petition. That's the most important thing. And come on down. We'll be here tomorrow. And mahalo for you guys' time. Share, share, share. Aloha. 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 Mahalo.